the Line Go Show After Show, um, EU edition, and we have DPR Jones, the infamous DPR Jones from the Magic Sandwich Show, and we have Brian J, which I forgot to introduce before, from his famous Friday Fail. Well, hardly famous. Oh, well, okay, but it's, it's pretty known, I guess. Getting there. Yeah. And we have D joining us with the cute cat pick. Hello. Okay, and go on, DPR, what were you saying to, um, you can go on, continue. I just want to know why I was introduced as infamous and everyone else was introduced as famous. We don't like Isn't it obvious? Interesting question. No, uh, let's see here, um, <laughs> because you have an insidious side to you, I guess you could say. We don't know, we don't know what Brian's insidious side is, but we know you have an insidious side. Well, we are on as a compliment as best I can, and let's move on. Um, you okay. want me to summarize what I was saying? Um, I, basically, I suppose I was saying that uh, it is society, uh, through the mechanism of law, that determines what is right and wrong. Um, and that is um, obviously not an objective state. Uh, it is purely subjective. It may not be perfect, but it is a system that we use. And um, to try and uh, sort of like basically use interesting philosophical arguments um, doesn't detract from the reality which is the system that we're working under. Now, you might have criticisms of that system, but it is a fairly effective system on the whole. And it is open for amendment. That's true. I, I would, the only thing that I would add to that is I would say that um, that that system establishes norms rather than morals, so to speak. But I think that that's really just quibbling over terminology because effectively they become the same, the same thing uh, functionally. I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, there's always the question. You, 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 I think, I think you were asking me about the issue of whether. Um, an ant could murder an ant, or whether I could have murder an ant. Um, and the simple answer, of course, is no, because murder is something that we, humans, have determined and set out exactly what determines murder and what doesn't. Uh, it is quite meaningless to talk about whether an ant could murder another ant. It just frustrates me that so much time is wasted in this sort of what I consider to be nonsense. Yeah, but uh, and I know you have a bugbear against uh, philosophy because we've we've um, sparred swords on that before. So that aside, um, but it's it is discussing questions like that that give us um, a foothold in certain insights, such as, as you know um, formulating um, protocols for example maybe we do uh, um, come across sentient alien life in a few decades so oh, if we've that. if we've thought Not outside the, the box then that gives right, us no, a no, better stop, let, let, yes let's let's jones that. i know you hate i know you absolutely hate no please but, one moment about studying okay. ants and that might teach us something and then he's talking about alien life that we may or may not find in a few decades, hundred years of time. I'm sorry, this is nonsense. Okay, let's no. let's cut to the chase. What about studying ants is going to affect our definition of murder? Precisely. Can something of another Again, you're, you're, genetic you're, 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 or another genus, for example, can something of a different species have morality? And what relevance that, does this that's have? That's the bigger question. Well, okay, let me give you let, now one of the personal things I fear. Morality. One of the personal things I fear horribly is aliens come to Earth and we still have this horribly anthropocentric genetic idea of morality. I mean, how could we possibly interact with other species or evolve um, if we ever happened? Again, this is hypothetical again. How can integrate with another, com in another species if we still think you can't have morality because you must be a bad species. I mean, that's but I don't think it's determined by that. I think that that's a complete straw man on your part. I completely agree. I completely agree because with you that we don't have a genetic, we don't have a genetic view, but the problem is, um, again, I'm going to have to just store my but data no one, here, but no one most does, Christians, so. 
most Christians do. That's most Christians. Wait, wait, I I'm mean, just that, well, that let me, wait, 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 Sam. Um, in the abortion debate, I'm going to bring this back to abortion debate. Yeah, I was just going to say. The majority is... of Christian arguments generally work around the point of that because a fetus is genetically human, it has worth. Now, think about the implication of that. If it has genetic, if it is genetically human, that is the definition of having moral value. Right. Um, wait, wait, that wait, is wait. scary wait, 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 if you hey, apply hey, that hey, generally across the board. Hey, hey, can, well, can, can, can wait, you... Sam, Sam, before you reply, um, Brett, you had something you wanted to ask like for like five minutes, I think it was? Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what the entire point of bringing up ants into the conversation is. Where are we trying to go with it? What's the goal of it? I'll tell you what my goal was. My goal was to uh, highlight the fact that uh, concepts such as murder are human constructs. They do not have any meaning when you apply them to um, other species. And I use ants as an example. And I will go back to you again, Brian. I want to, you know, oh, studying, this is your comment. Studying ants may give us an insight into morality and definition of murder. Please justify that. Because at the moment, okay, what I, you're talking crap. Okay, uh, what, the, point, the point that I'm trying to make with that is that unless we step outside our anthropomorphism, yeah, if we don't step out of the box psychologically and, and try and understand uh, other species' um, ethics, and this is, remember, this is in the context of the previous show, which was secular ethics, okay? So, if we do run into other sentient life, and studies are showing that the life on this planet is a lot more sentient than we've previously given credit for, how are we going to be able to think non-human ethic if we restrict our study and our thoughts to what it is to be human and therefore using that to define an absolute system of ethics. I'm done. I'm sorry, I missed, I missed a part of it. What, what, what were you saying? I, well, just a, just a talk for talking sake, I think you're right in the fact that we, there are other species that could feasibly be sentient, if not provably so. Steve, and that I, does have a lot of relevance. Steve, I wanted to comment. You made a comment that Christians generally, um, when they think of things, they think of them genetically. Well, I think that the problem is, is that they're trying to extend an argument that they know atheists won't accept, at least for abortion, because they believe that the soul enters the um, enters the embryo once it's fertilized, and they to get around the fact that no one who d who is not religious isn't is going to accept this, they invent this genetic idea, which can be easily debunked. However, when you talk about things like why they don't eat meat or why you know a dog isn't responsible for defecating in the house, they talk about the the capability of reasoning in terms of their morality and that's always been the way you know any reasonable adult tends to define it the issue is um as i see it is you know what do we you know how competent a given person or a given organism is to reason about their actions but that's an entirely different discussion than you know necessarily whether ants can do this i mean it, it's a bit it's a bit missing the point, I think, and I agree with DPR in that well, sense. Getting can back, I, can to I just the say, because this was addressed in a real quickly. context, given given the work that we're doing on artificial intelligence and some of the theories concerning emergent awareness with cognitive complexity, and the fact that we're going into an era of neural computing, yeah, the. The, 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 the reality of coming into a non-human sentience may be closer than we think. Well, I mean, would you say... I mean, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I say, um, I have to agree with Brian Jay. I mean, philosophy and ethics especially has to become more like a more of a bulwark, bulwark against... I mean, I respect your opinion, DPR, but I think philosophy has to extend to these thought experiments or these possibilities because 
these things might seriously happen. They're not extreme unlikelihoods that we that there is other things that are sentient out there that we may contact at some point. And if we don't have some ethics that can accommodate this, we're going to have some extremely horrible disputes that emerge. And I would rather be in a situation where we can accommodate um, a, pe a peaceful situation than a warring one. At the same time, um, I still don't see the merit in ants as moral creatures. I think the moral creature has to be val has to be sentient, has to be rational in some respect, which is, um, I, I'm, I'm jumping between people now, but it's well, I, which is why I want to go to what Sam said, um, that he is right and really there's no fruitful debate among philosophers that I've found, no fruitful argument in favour of a genetic evaluation of a um, human being. But the problem is, the majority of people, and unfortunately statesmen, um, do hold this position. That's, that's not the position that they hold, though, and that's the problem that I keep stating, is that most of them are going from the presupposition that this is what the Bible says, and that there's a yeah. soul inside of the fetus. They're not going from, oh, well, the base pairs match up with what defines a human. I mean, let's not... Okay, well, let, you've right, said then, this um, two times, and it, you know, right, I think that we right, should then. go through honestly with their arguments. Right, then let, me um, let me rephrase what I meant. By genetic human, I mean, if you were of the species of human, the species, and to use a few start Christian language here, the species um, of the people that God ordained to be rulers of the earth, that kind of, and rulers of all of his creation. And when you have this dominion attitude of we, as humans, have the right to rule all other species, then you're going to get to the point where you say, if aliens come into play who are sentient, you're going to get to the case where pe these people will say, we as humans have the right, ordained by God, to rule over other sentient people. And I class that as very much slavery, in a sense. Yes, beyond arrogance. Yes, and if we have this still in society, this ethical point, then, <laughs> to use the to use the ironic phrase, God help us all. Well, it's, it's a humanocentric kind of thing, right? Pretty much saying that we're the dominant species and stuff. Mm. Yeah, or an anthropocentric. anthropocentric. I mean, we don't yeah. know. We don't know. I mean, would you say it's a little bit mischaracterization saying we're not the dominant species on Earth? You know, we're 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 the well, you could say we're the we're not the strongest either. Like bacteria, I think are the dominant species, aren't they? Define uh, dominance. Yeah, I would say we're dominant on the fact that basically if something, in, any individual thing annoys us, we can absolutely destroy it. Uh, can That's destroy not black true. Hole? Can't destroy AIDS. At least not yet. Well, we, we can give it a crap. Okay, we can beat AIDS. I mean, we're slightly more dominant than AIDS, I would say. I mean, it all depends on how you define dominance. Yeah, I guess. It may just come down to intuition, really. Yeah, I would really. say that depends on your definition of dominance. I mean, insects are doing a pretty damn good job. Okay, I think you're right. I think it's just compared to... Yeah, I think they, I I think think they outweigh us something like... Uh, yeah, the malt, yeah, they outweigh us in body weight, I'm mm. fairly certain. What about the cold? It keeps, um, I was going to say migrating, it keeps, what's the word I'm looking for, changing. Um, mutating. Mutating, thank you, darling. There we go, yeah. You know, you know, it keeps mutating, so it's like the, the cold you had last week isn't the cold you've got this week because it's mutated and, and knows how to adapt itself. But, uh, but I was saying, we're like, well, what are we dominant at? We're dominant at, I guess you could say, we're not, we're not, um, well, I'll say we're, 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 we're adaptive. We're extremely adaptive for one yeah. species, I guess you could say, because I can't think of a species. I'd say... I can't think I'd say we're technologically dominant, that's for certain. Yeah. Well, Intellectually, yeah. I'm not so sure. The dolphins could possibly give us a they good... They will rise up and uh, destroy us all. ...once we figure out the communication barrier. If a dolphin manages to out... De the dolphins could debate Christians, and that would be the single funniest thing I would ever... I would pay to see that. I would <laughs> donate so much. That would be brilliant. I'd like to see dolphins um, debate atheists as well. Just make it yeah. entertaining. I'd, for I'd, I'd it would like be to quite see good. dolphins debate anybody. I just love to see a dolphin debate. Why do I, I think? Why, why do I, I think? would love dolphin for president or prime minister. <laughs> the, the first way dolphin president would be such a great thing. Maybe it's just the way you phrased it, but that kind of almost presupposes that dolphins aren't atheists. If you'd love to see them debating atheists, or maybe it's just 
your phraseology was a little... Well, for all, I, for I, all I, we know, know, they might be just as diverse on that issue as we are. Well, um, <laughs> that's, I'm not saying they're not atheists or they are atheists, I'm just saying... <laughs> just, That'd be fantastic. What I think DPR is like saying, why the fuck are we talking about dolphins? Mm-hmm. <laughs> dolphins are awesome. Eh, you can eat them. Hey, what? No, you shouldn't. No. <laughs> like that. Why shouldn't I eat them? Why, why shouldn't I? We, we eat cows. People. What, we eat cows, though. Well, you I'm eat just cows. just trying to the conversation. Cows. We've gone from... Eat another. We've gone from ants to aliens via abortion to AIDS and now we're on dolphins and you expect me to keep up with this conversation and why <laughs> just just guess where we're going next and just pretend that's just just great <laughs> ants aliens abortion and AIDS. space dolphins they all become a base they all become a base we've moved to the cliff. dolphins <laughs> oh my god oh damn so close but yeah so um... so denmark what about Denmark? Is that something know. rotten in the borough of Denmark? No, that can't be right. We're very good at topic <laughs> jumping. Well, well, I blame you, Stephen. You should. I'm just. I am the brute cause of this. I think. What the hell is urban reverse cowgirl? I didn't even. That's want to what go. I was just. Wondering. I don't want to. I don't. <laughs> I read that and just moved God. away. <laughs> is that is that similar to the reverse troll? I uh I had a friend where she was reverse cowgirl for. Halloween, and uh, I made a joke about, oh, that must be useful for later. You'll have a guide on what to do, and then I got smacked in the face. Isn't a reverse oh, cowgirl? Yeah. Isn't isn't an urban reverse cowgirl? Isn't that technically a businesswoman? I I think. What's the reverse of a ca of a cowgirl? I think a business. Uh, isn't it when you turn them around? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was where my mind goes. I mean, I, that's what I was guessing. <laughs> we should probably Google it instead of just speculating. You we don't want to Google that on a public. That's computer. true, actually. Urban yeah. dictionary. <laughs> urban dictionary. Urban dictionary. Urban reverse. Oh fuck! I'm just gonna do it. I'll, no, no I got reverse. it. I got, I got it. <laughs> urban dictionary. Let's see what it says. It says, um, um, a sexual position where the female is in the superior position by placing herself on top of the male and, and facing his feet. Okay. <laughs> okay. So urban is obviously doing it in town then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad we sorted that out. Yeah, that yeah. was something that now that I needed to have one. confirmation. That was an easy one. Oh no, it's got complicated. We've now got urban doggy style. Well, I have no need to label my sexual positions. I just get on and have sex. <laughs> I, yeah, I'd like to do it. Yeah. Why, why, why do I think you're lazy? You're like the lazy person. You're not going to do something. You're not going to you're going to do missionary. I am lazy, but no, I don't just do that. There's some things I'm not lazy about. Yeah, I mean so, some women just <laughs> like to get on with it, not bother about what it's called. <laughs> so DPR, how did, uh, how did we get to this? <laughs> yeah, I blame blame the convo now. Um um DPR, you have anything to say? Anything at all? No, not at the moment. Well, as you hear, as you hear, DPR, I am curious as to why it is you have such aversion to philosophy in all its forms. I don't. I was going to say I don't recall him having said that. I... Well, it just it just strikes me as that every time it goes anywhere near philosophy, um, your reaction is to nod off. Yeah, because mainly the talk people like you with a few big words. Sorry? Sorry, I didn't hear. Ooh. Uh, I have no problem with philosophy, uh, if you can define it. You tell me what philosophy is, Brian. Ah. Uh. My God, you don't know. <laughs> My own personal understanding of philosophy oh, oh, is oh, no, you just the... criticized me you've just criticized me for criticizing philosophy and yet you're struggling to define what philosophy is no 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 you asked me to define define philosophy huh? and i was just about to and then you oh, criticized please. me for oh, not yeah. being able to I apologize 
My understanding of philosophy is it's the academic discipline of asking difficult questions. Right. Well, I mean, I think I think DPR and, and thinks well, pause, pause, mm, that would and pause one second, please, Brian. Tell me when I have ever, if that's your definition of philosophy, when I, when have I ever criticised asking questions, whether they be difficult or not? Well, uh, I just remember one time. Uh, oh, it's going back a long time, but we were in a conversation and you did just blanket dismiss philosophy and to do so you asked me a moral question and when I gave you a subjective answer you used that as your slam dunk there you go I win shut the fuck up and that's puzzled me ever since what did I ask you Uh, it was, so, as I remember, it was something along the lines of the dilemma that Steve gave earlier with the, you're standing there, you're being told to kill these people or get a bullet in your head as well. I suspect it and, was a trolley problem. Sorry? I suspect it was the trolley problem that I posed to. The trolley problem? What's wrong with a trolley problem? What's what with the trolley problem? What's oh, problem yes, it's a great yeah, analogy. something about yeah, yeah, that was right. Yes, it was. Oh, just, um, and just do do you do you switch the terminal so that it goes one way or the other, yes. and the consequences would there were consequences to each, and the yes. moral decision was which did you consider of least moral detriment? Yes, and the reason I asked that was because. However much you can discuss philosophy, you will never get an answer that is correct, will you? Uh, definitively correct, no. That was my point. Now, let me explain. Perceptively yeah. and personally correct, I would disagree. Yes, of course, because you make a personal choice. Yeah. I was, probably arguing, I was probably arguing at that point about the idea of objective uh, morality, which of course I firmly believe does not exist. But let me just help you out here, Brian. In, and, and this is something I said to Steve only a few hours ago, but before this show started. Uh, so at least he will be able to say that I'm consistent, if nothing else. I have no problem with philosophy if you define it as thinking and questioning and questioning maybe the underlying axioms that we probably all use to deal yeah. with the world and understand the world. I have no problem with that whatsoever. The problem I have with philosophers is when they purport or attempt to try and take their discipline to levels where it should not and cannot reach, namely that you can. For example, I used, <coughs> excuse me, I used with uh, Steve before the example of William Lane Craig, who believes that he can use philosophy to argue into existence his God. That is going far beyond uh, what I consider philosophy should and is. Now, can I ask? I also used uh, the analogy when I listen to A.C. Grayling or the likes of Daniel Dennett, I do not see in them, oh, this man stands out as a philosopher. No, what I see there is someone who is insightful and thoughtful uh, and presents coherent arguments, whether in written form or orally, whatever, uh, but not. I, I, I wouldn't sort of like immediately listen to them and say, oh yeah, that's a philosophical argument, because I don't see what a philosophical argument is. And yet there are many people, um, and I'm not including you in this towering, I assure you, there are many people I've come across in life and on the internet who think, because they knew, know a few uh, big words, epistemology and ontology and whatever ologies they want to throw in there, they somehow uh, gain credence and think that they're intellectual. No, they're not. They're boring fucking asses, and they should stop trying to be intellectual. True philosophers don't have to put on that pretense. True philosophy, in my view, is can only be described as questioning and thinking. And I encourage, I positively encourage everyone to think and question. So, depending on your definition of philosophy, on my definition, I positively support philosophy. But, those who try and extend that definition to other disciplines and in other areas, no, I just think that being 
um, pseudo intellectual assholes. So, would it be fair to say that um, philosophy should or is inherently limited to uh, questioning and thinking on empirically provable or accessible I, 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 I do not see how you can possibly say that questioning and thinking can be limited. Okay, that's, the, uh, that's fine, that's fine, that's, yeah. Well, I think, I think you can um, add limited to things. <laughs> I think you can add well, limited no, to things that aren't covered in another perhaps, definition. Perhaps you haven't got it, let me explain again. Thinking and questioning can only lead you so far. It cannot make some quantum leap into areas where it does not have any right to go. Well, yeah, question, well, and, question and reasoning. Well, well, for example, philosophy can question morality. It can, it yeah. can pose all sorts of questions, but it cannot. By definition, it cannot come up with an answer. So you cannot say, well, I've got this philosophical argument to prove X. Okay, well, I get just, where you're going me, with it now. Yes, me, philosophy me, is more it? than a method, is more a methodology. Yes. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't like that expression, but I think you're getting closer to my my description of it. It's pretty yeah. much way as science isn't a collection of answers, it is a collection of methodologies. I don't like the word methodologies. Do you mean it's a, all right, it's a way of discovering truths rather than a truth in itself? Yes. Would that be a bit more accurate? Yeah. That, that, would, be, that would be better, yes. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Yeah, the, exactly. the only pro the problem, of course, is that for unlike, for example, science or maths, which is mathematics, has a very uh, well, simple, I'll tell you, I'll tell you clear. This, Steve, if I may, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, I go mean, ahead. As you all know, uh, studying philosophy yourself, um, there was a time where um, science and philosophy were effectively um, considered to be the same thing. Um, the natural sciences, in, in the, t the days of um, uh, Newton, for example, um, they, they were effectively considered to be the same thing. It's only about a couple of hundred years ago that these two branches separated, uh, and science uh, and philosophy parted ways, and um, science became empirical, whereas philosophy remained... Um, Non-empirical. Non-empirical. Oh. I was going to use another word, but thank you for that. Yeah, and, and so there was this separation, and what you, I suppose, but in its most simplistic terms, is I'm saying that um, philosophy, and I've got to be cautious about this because I've been corrected about it, but in general terms, philosophy doesn't deal with empirical evidence, whereas science does. And that is now oh. the distinction. That is now the distinction between the two. I know you're going to come back on me, and I know exactly what argument you're going to yeah. use. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, just, I, 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 I would I'm just like to throw examples. one, I'd just like to throw one go phrase go in ahead. at this point. And that, that would be a definite philosophy as being the discipline of speculation within what's already been established. Go ahead. Steve, what did you have to say? I mean, I, mean, I could just go through some counterexamples of where philosophy uses empiricism. I mean, in, in this, before I go into it, philosophy has the, probably the single strongest union with science. And almost all philosophers completely and wholly respect the tradition of science to such an extent that it takes science to justify most of its arguments. Uh, the most obvious case I can think of is um, the live, it's called the Libet experiment, which is very famous among philosophers, although less among scientists itself. And it's the thing that um, humans, um, I think it's a well explained again, humans um, already think something before they actively will it to happen. So. Um, the idea is a light comes up and I click a buzzer um, to signal that I see the light. Now, the neurons fire in the head before you actively make the thought I'm going to push the button, that you need to push the button. So in other words, you've already made the decision before you've consciously thought about it. And the point is philosophers have used this empirical data to justify um, hard determinism, which is the phrase meaning everything um, is determined externally. So my actions are determined rather than my, for example. Or um, for another example, um, the Nuremberg trials, another example of 
should be empirically not oh, precedent. Steve, your mic sounds like crap. Yeah, this might be poor connection. Yeah. I mean, how much of that? Of course, I'll just stick with that example then. Um, can you, can you uh, just uh, see? Uh, uh, I was struggling to uh, uh, hear you as well. Um, okay. Just pick up, pick up if you could on the Nuremberg trial. Well, um, well, the Nuremberg trial is a good example of how um, many philosophers contributed to um, trying to convict uh, Germans for um, German officers, German judges, etc., for committing crimes. And they based Sorry, which, it. Which, hang on a second. What philosophers were involved in the Nuremberg trials and in what practical way were they okay. involved? Um, more indirectly than directly, but most of the um, judges um, based a lot of what they used off of the principle of authenticity or mauvais foi, which is, I, I don't like these terms, but it's one of the phrases used by um, Jean Paul Sartre and other existential philosophers which basically means um, you have to accept responsibility for your actions even if you say that it's been caused by your environment you are ultimately responsible for it. But isn't that so that's got nothing system, to do with stands. philosophy. The Nuremberg trial was set up in such a way that they were going to get convictions. It's yes. got nothing to do with, uh, with philosophy. It was, um, I have to say, in some regards, um, an outrageous rewriting of uh, the legal system and retrospective in many regards. Um, and um, whilst it, I, I think it probably ended up being a good thing, it, it was victor's justice. It's got nothing to do with philosophy. It was just a purely political decision. Yes, but of uh, course I, they had to have justification behind it, otherwise it wasn't a trial. Yeah, they, it was they, they justified it on, on um, the spurious, spurious basis, um, such as customary law that existed at the time. But in fact, it did because yeah, they based uh, well, they, yes, they based it on the uh, idea that there's a universal ethical principle. Hang on, one second, if I may. The uh, Jackson was his name, the main prosecutor from the United States, basically. Um, made statements prior to the trial starting, saying we are going to convict these people, and the laws and the charges which were written against them were somewhat novel, and they were written in order to secure a conviction. Uh, it, this, this has got nothing to do with philosophy. Wait, this wait, wait, DPR, are you, pretty, are you pretty much saying that they would have, like, pretty much the, the, the court, there was pretty much, it was a one-way trial? Of course it was, it was victor's justice. Yeah. Uh, right, because I can see. I, I, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of history about it, if I may. Um, I mean, Churchill was having none of this um, before the end of the war um, at the London Conference, which took place, I think, in 1944, um, which was basically uh, between uh, France, United States, and United Kingdom, um, which was, you know, what we were, what we were, what should we do to these people after the war? Um, Churchill was very much for, let's just um, get the main leaders together, um, execute them, hang them without a trial. And interesting enough, for once, the United States was more interested in international law than uh, in international justice than ever before, uh, and convinced uh, Churchill that no, we ought to have a trial. But the charges that were drawn against the, um, particularly the first trial, in which the main 23 I think it was uh, defendants for this trial, um, were drawn up um, from, yeah, there were some tangible aspects of customary law or whatever, but they were basically created in order to justify or, or to secure a conviction. Jackson, as I say, the main prosecutor before the trial had even started, basically said, we have got to secure a conviction in this uh, in these trials. And of course, it was. A, I, I'll give you um, yet another example of this. The um, carpet bombing that the RAF uh, and also the US were, were involved in this um, over cities such as, in fact, Nuremberg itself, Dresden, Hamburg, um, were undoubtedly breaches of international law uh, at that time. And what's interesting is that in the Nuremberg trials, no charges were brought against any of these people for the bombing of Coventry or of London or the um, V1, V2 bombings um, because the defense would have been open to them 
to say, well, hang on, you did that to us. What are you complaining about? They didn't yeah, pretty much, pretty much, pretty much. And war. this is oh. all done because they they manipulated that entire trial um, to ensure conviction. But this has got nothing to do with philosophy. I don't know why you think that philosophy had anything to do with uh, all right, the trial. All right, then let me add bit. Let me just add some of the tiny bits you missed out. Then um, of the tribunal members um, who were the people and members as part of the um, trial, specifically the Russell Tribunal. The ma major tribunal members included people like Simone de Beauvoir, um, one of the most famous female philosophers of all time, Jean-Paul Sartre, probably the most famous existentialist of all time, and Bertrand Russell, probably the most famous 20th century philosopher so of all what, time. What, what, all what, of these contributed, what, sorry, can I just finish this? Uh, all of these contributed to the actual um, results of the tribunals. I mean, um, the results? So, were they party to the trial? Yes, but the point is the trials did not and themselves purely, the purely yes, include the punishment of um, the Germans. Um, they, for example, John Paul Sartre... Were they the trial process? John Paul Sartre specifically... DPR Jones, I think what DPR Jones is trying to establish is whether they were part of the, um, you know, the, the actual process. deliberations. Well, they were the voters on it. They put forth through most, almost all the verdicts that the groups voted on. John Paul Sartre was sitting on as a judge. What are you talking about? He was sitting as a tribunal member, and the tribune and the evidence presented in the conclusions of the verdicts depended on the tribunal members. I, I don't so understand this. Though. I know, I know, I, I know. By the end of the war, pretty much every side, pretty much, was starting to bomb civilian targets. Everyone was starting to do shit that was, even the Treaty of Versailles was saying, you should not do this, you should not do that. Pretty much everyone threw that out the window. Uh, Japanese did chemis chemical, um, biological warfare. No one mentioned that. I don't think that much. But yeah, like, like fuck, I mean... I, I'm, I, I'm totally sorry that I need to go back, and I'm, I'm sure Steve has got a point, but I'm just missing it. My question is, what part did these philosophers actually play in the trial process? They were part of the tribunal members. Can you what are the source for this? Including pardon? Can we get including a and the most this? important members. part of this is influence in the Russell Tribunal. Unless my history has gone to shite. But I don't but the understand. major point I, but the I, major I, influence they had was the Sorry, what are the tribunal members? The members who vote and associate themselves with the results Wait. of I, 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 I honestly you need to look this up because I, I do not understand what you're talking about. They were not yeah, could you actually source this? They were this? not party to the process, so far as I understand. And this is something that I do okay, not Okay, we, we have some information from Sirius Mind in the chat room. There is the sorry example of the 1967 Stockholm war, tri war crime trial when, under the presidency of John Paul Sartre, a 17-person jury listened to charges leveled against the United States. So it's a different thing. But... Um, philosophers would seem to be evident in war crime trials. No, I'm asking specifically about Nuremberg. All right, let this me put my hands Nuremberg. up then. Let me it put my hands Nuremberg. up then. I'd probably have just been mistaken on minor part of history there. I've been confusing uh, my... There are a details. couple of links in the chat room to Nuremberg precedents and the trials judges. Can you send me a link to the chat room, because I'm not seeing that at the moment. It's in the Vaughan Live. Um, uh, can, you, can you post a link? Yeah, I'll Hello, get it. Hold on. Thank you. I mean, uh, I, I think that I tend to be sort of sympathetic with DPR in the sense that I don't, you know, I, I work in, in a bio lab. I'm, you know, in it right now. But the, the, the issue that I have with people when it specifically comes to when they tout philosophy, is there are a lot of people who believe because they are well versed in philosophy that they that that knowledge and their ability to sort of freewheel philosophically allows them to say things about the world that are completely unjustified, and they believe that philosophy is a much more powerful tool than it is. Can I just and that's say, the issue that I have. Can I just say that's almost certainly true within philosophy. It does seem to happen a lot more. It's not the worst at it. I'd say psychology is the worst at it. But it's close. That's, the problem is when you have something as broad as philosophy, it gets very what, difficult. 
to keep out the crackpots. I mean, the the hard part of philosophy is that it's a shrinking field of of relevance in terms of study. Well, I and disagree. That's very with that. unfortunate. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's I a moving. Agree it's with shifting. that as well because it, it, it shifts. Expands. Yeah, there's it, parts it, of it which it leaves, of shifting. course. I mean, but, if, um, you, if you look at modern, if, if you look at the spec. Sorry, Steve. Carry on. Saga. I mean, the point about philosophy is that it addresses issues of the day, and it, whenever new new issues come up, and usually as a result of scientific de developments or economic or um, political developments, philosophy is on the fore and addressing them. Um, I mean, some of the major ones that come about now is environmental ethics since the 60s, um, globalization as an ethics in the um, 80s, bioethics since the in the 21st century, hacker ethics in the 21st century. Most of these, of course, are ethical theories, um, but then there's, um, to use more philosophical problems, the um, problems like uh, Gettier problems, which is problems within epistemology about what we know um, and it has been recently developed, and through and determinism has revived itself from the 20th century. I mean, it constantly changes. At the same time, there's parts of it which it leaves, undoubtedly. So, for example, um, I mean, science generally absorbs, has absorbed a very large amount of different problems for itself, um, as well as psychology and anthropology and sociology has absorbed what is a religion. But at the same time, it still exists in many different. Many different We're losing you. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, just note, anyone in the chat, anyone in the chat, if they want to join, they um, call Sir Strife if they want to join the convo. Because this can go on for a while, actually. I'd love Sirius to join us. Um, I think Sirius is a very rational, um, sensible person. Well, um, Sirius, you got you got an invite from the infamous DPR. I'm gonna keep doing that. Do you want me to uh, pull him in? Because yeah, I'd, I'd like to have Joe in um, here as well. Uh, go ahead. Join it. But it's interesting well, what you just said, Steve, right? I don't know whether you did it uh, consciously or deliberately, but uh, you said philosophy is always sort of like shifting and changing. Um, I think that's, that's instructive in ways, no? Yeah. Well, self, uh, let's, let's, let's just be blunt about this. Self-correction is not limited to philosophy. Science also self-corrects. I, I, wait, I honestly don't, see, I, I honestly don't see how philosophy... Everything's self-correct. But how does philosophy self-correct? Because someone else's ideas could just, you know... Well, because um, can I, can I give an example or do you want to? You well, I was, just going to, I was just going to give the concept that as long as the speculation remains consistent with what's established, then that opens the doors to... Yeah, all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Look at quantum physics. Yeah, let's look at quantum figure physics. Did you invite, yeah. um, what's his face here? Yeah, I'm just pulling him in. Uh, I mean, one of the really interesting things about quantum physics is many people are taking it to very successfully as an argument for uncertainty. Because before quantum physics, or before quantum physics rather took much of a hold, so up to about the 50s or 60s, um, harder determinism or the philosophy that everything everyone does is determined by external forces was astoundingly prominent. But well, the issue is, it's evolved. the issue that I see is that that is an instance of philosophers commenting and not actually you know, if, if you listen to the actual scientists who are talking about this, and, and that's one of the criticisms that I have against philosophers, not philosophy, is, so, is that so they much, is, is that philosophers love to comment on things that they don't necessarily understand as it comes to very complex subjects in science. And that's a function of human, that's human nature, that has nothing to do with... Yeah, that's a human failure. Yeah, it's, so, I mean, it happens in every discipline, it's the problem. And, and but, so... I mean, in the 50s... Listen, uh, yeah, but if you listen to what the actual scientists are saying, you know, they're very much more tentative about what their models are saying and trying to actually parse through what's going on. So, well, in the, you know, I, the I don't necessarily... This is why I don't, like, try to take cues from philosophers on a lot of stuff, is because it's very, they, they tend to more go in sort of bold claims rather than people who are a little bit more cautious, in my opinion. Well, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, this, the scientists were 
essentially saying in large droves that everything is determined, but we haven't found anything rather that isn't determined. And that works as very strong evidence in favour of the principle that how determinism or everything is a result of external preceding causes is true. Um, D, I'm going to kick you from the call because we have a little bit too many. Is that okay? Okay. Since you're just pretty much, yeah. Goodbye. But I mean, like, from what I've heard I mean, in the early um, turn of the 19th, in the 20th century, with science, they thought they knew everything via the um, electromagnetism or something. They thought that was the problem to everything, I think it was, right? In the philosophy of science, right? I'm not a brilliant on the old-fashioned philosophy of science. Well... Can't comment too too strongly on that. Well, I Free mean, determinism, yes. Philosophy of science, not my forte, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> When was this idea of determinism? Of well, determinism, I think it's very old. It's maybe 300 BC. No, no, I, I mean, meant, it was meant, most dominant in, yeah, the turn of the 20th century. Yeah, that, that's what I'm about, saying. Yeah, about early, ni late 19th, 19th century to about the 40s or 50s or 60s. Uh, but then the philosophy called Peter van den Bargen came about um, and quantum, with quantum physics and turned the whole thing on its head and brought back the debates, as well as Peter Strauss and other philosophers helping him out, on top of open theism promoting it, um, and unfortunately theism is a very large um, portion of philosophy, well, philosophers. I mean, I mean because um, from what I've read, the electromag they thought electromagnetism was the fundamental force that controlled everything in the universe, and you can use electromagnetism to understand everything. I think it was like this was the ether, the ether of, of light and such like that. Well, no. Uh, uh, electromagnetism is one of the four fundamentals. No, 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 no. I, I didn't say I, I didn't say it was, but I'm saying they thought it was like the uh, they had like a world view, the electromagnetic world view. They thought electromagnetism was everything. Like it, it's like a permeated force, like the ether. No, no, it was not like the ether. And ether, and ether wasn't a force either. It was a medium, uh, or that's what they thought anyway. They, yeah, they the thought that light required light. medium to, to transport in the same way that uh, sound that sound does. Well, I'm thinking of something similar to that, where they mentioned made theories about how light. I forget. Just. Well, I mean, they thought definitely... they had all the answers, pretty much. I before, think be the word. Well, everyone before, always thinks they have all the before, answers. Before the strong and nuclear, strong and weak nuclear forces were detected. Um, yeah, electromagnetism seemed to be bigger than it was because it was the only thing that we could really detect. Um, and we knew gravity also, but uh, there were you know we just did not have the uh, the, the uh, uh, technology to know that the, the strong weak force was there. So yeah, there were there were some that made more out of it than it was, but it still it is a fundamental force of of everything. Well, I mean, I knew it's a fundamental force. I'm just saying that I, what I've read there was like a world view in science that some scientists had that electromagnetism was the some kind of like grand. Uh, Unification theory, kind of like you could be used as a grand unification. No, well, I, I don't think I that was the case. I wouldn't say that that was that that was universal. I didn't say, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not saying that either, but I'm just saying like yeah, there some. may have been there may have been some, but but again, you know, in, in any you know any era of science, you, you when, once you know you have what we would consider modern science, uh, there were different schools of thought, just like there are today. I mean, not every uh, astrophysicist or, or cosmologist. Uh, you know, cottons to M theory. You know, uh, uh, you know, there's all, all sorts of different ways that you know. There's different camps, and eventually, hopefully, you know, we figure this stuff out. But the thing is, it's not. It's not. I mean, I I don't know about. It's not philosophy in the same way that we would say that uh, you know Sartre or uh, or um, you know John Stuart Mill or, or Kant or somebody like that. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's a totally different different view, and I've had some people tell me that they feel that science, or the the study of science is for philosophy in and of itself, but I'm not sure I agree. Well, so, there's an interesting, yeah, the, the, there's an interesting point arising from that, Joe, uh, and that is um, a discrete variance in the types of philosophy. I mean, you've got philosophy when it comes to understanding the deep questions of science, but you've also got philosophy when it comes to understanding the deeper questions of the human condition, what it is to be human, what drives us, you know, what binds us, what, you know, what motivates us, what controls us. So when you, when you start delving into those, you know, 
differences of types of philosophy, then you're talking very different disciplines because you're talking very different types of data. You know, one is very empirical, very analy you know, analytical, open to analysis, and the other is very speculative by nature. Well, it's kind of, kind of uh, and I think I know what you mean, Brian. Like, for instance, I said earlier that I do find philosophy useful when we want to uh, examine morality uh, and either derive a system of morality, like, again, I mentioned Kant and Mill, or uh, something like that, but then you get into the, you know, eg uh, existentialist, which I always felt was, that's, you know, it's very speculative. It's like, well, this, you know, it's like, you know, the whole, uh, you know, are we a, a um, product of, of, of some mind, or we, are we in a computer, or anything like that? Sorry. We can speculate all we want, but it, it doesn't really mean anything. Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing that really matters is that, the, the, sorry, Steve, I didn't mean to cut you off. It, all that really matters is that it is consistent with what has been established, surely. As a speculation. Yeah, and and the thing is, I mean, and actually, I know uh, somebody had commented. I, I did I did take a class, uh, you know, only only one, but I did take a class of class. We we did look at the existentialists. I, I found it kind of dry and boring and very uh, again very speculative and it, and so and also kind of a lot of mental masturbation because it was it was like well it's like well what is the nature of reality? I, I'm not sure I care. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, well, honestly, I would say it was yeah, some sorry, philosophy. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was going to give an example. Uh, sorry, I was going to I was going to uh, give Steve a chance because I did cut him off rather. Oh, Steve had something to say? Okay. Yeah, I would say that, yeah, how would you define existentialism? Because we've got contrasting, I think we've got contrasting definitions or understandings of it. Well, actually, I'm glad you brought up the word definition because that was actually something else that, uh, you know, when, when I, you know, I obviously DPR is not, he doesn't see a lot of utility in philosophy, and what I what I find that, and why I get frustrated with people who fancy themselves like pop philosophers is that, uh, you know, they do get, you know tend tend to get bogged down into definitions and oh well is this epistemology or is this that and you're speaking this way or that way, and it, 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 you know it's 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 not productive in my in my opinion a lot. Okay, all I mean is um, explain what what you think it is again, because you did say it, I just missed. I just want to double, double check because my understanding of it when I've studied it before if the idea is based on two general assumptions it's firstly the assumption that humans um, it's blatantly obvious that humans have free will or that humans have choice in what one does and secondly that the universe is, is in inverted commas absurd in other words the universe rewards people who do bad things and punishes people who does good things. That was not my understanding of existentialism when I... I mean, there were people, there were existentialists who took that view, but that was really, I mean, as I understood it, existentialism, and it really had to do with, you know, uh, the Cartesian thing, and, and you know, or not, yeah, not, not the part. Uh, yeah, again, I'm studying, I know it can work across... You know what I mean. <laughs> Descartes coming into it, that's the thing. <laughs> I mean, existentialism is very awkward because it's it's one of the few philosophies where everyone, we, when we point to the existentialists, they deny being existentialists. But, yeah, I mean, that's generally how I've understood it. Now, then, there is some things, honestly, I would say science, or would I say philosophers of science, or, well, like, you guys know who Gish is, right? We all know who Gish is, right? The Gish galloping Gish. Yes. I've read in the book, um, which I've mentioned like several times, there was a part where pretty much like he said, well, nobody knows what entropy is, so pretty much if you pull up entropy card on anybody on evolution, it's like, how the fuck do we counter this? Because, you know, not every, when they, when in the 80s, or supposedly in the 80s, seems like nobody knew what entropy was. I mean... Well, there's a distinction between the populist understanding and an elitist understanding. In the sense that we have a very elitist understanding in philosophy of many things, and in science of many things, but explaining it simply to people has always been, is always quite difficult. I think that's been the problem. Yeah, and and, and I think the main reason for that is uh, the difference in technical language versus colloquial usage, um, because uh, when we are formalising schematics and you know legalese and technicalese. 
we do need to have very rigid um, definitions for things, otherwise the system isn't workable. But when it comes to uh, our general interactions, we have a very loose, very metaphorical use of language. You know, because when we're talking about something or we're asked to describe something, we will do it in terms of other things. So our colloquial use of language is very, very loose. And I think that's where a lot of the misunderstandings and the discrepancies arise. And that obviously is cause for many of the arguments that we see. That's my interpretation. Well, and I think that's in general. Uh, I had an argument the last couple of days just about uh, you know, what the meaning of explosion is, because it has a very st uh, strict meaning in chemistry, and it's being used in you know, by the layman in a way that's not intended. Are you talking about, like, the word bang? Well, th there was a case uh, uh, that just came up recently. Apparently, uh, the 16-year-old girl that uh, um, she she mixed uh, aluminum foil and drain cleaner in a, in a soda bottle and it popped. And she's basically being charged of having created an explosive device. And in no way, in a chemical sense, is what she created an explosive. Well, what is it then? Well, it basically, it's, 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 what she produced was off-gassing. Off-gassing built pressure inside the bottle, and the bottle popped open. It, it, had a, it had a violent release of pressure. That is not an explosion. Explosion, in the chemical sense, is, effect, is a chain reaction involving free radicals um, and generally you know, heat and some, you know, some, some sort of ignition source um, and, you general, and re release of thermal energy. Uh, what she did was not in any way an explosion but in the colloqu colloqu in the colloqu I can't speak today colloquial. The colloquial sense yes people will call that an explosion because the thing went pop and and things expanded out in other in other ways out in all directions in the chemical sense what was she did was not an expl uh, explos explosion and it was not an explosive i mean it seems like to me maybe it's the fact that we have two distinct definitions in science and uh, general thought of you know like theory and um bang and bang, like you know like when people think of bang they think of like a grenade or an explosion right right well the thing is though it's, it's mostly because the layman doesn't necessarily understand these terms but starts using them and then they take on an alternative meaning uh, in in the public oh yeah yeah I mean when you when you're looking at something like bang uh, what else goes bang a balloon goes bang and that is not in any way an explosion not even in the exo, in you know, implo. Well, well here's, here's a good example. You, just say you took a bottle of soda um, and you heated it up. Um, you know, it's going to liberate the uh, CO2 that's dissolved because uh, CO2 actually dissolves better in, in cold fluids. And um, it's the nature of gases and, and liquids. And um, you, you could heat it up to the point where that thing, that uh, uh, would pop open. Would we say that soda is an explo is, ex is an explosive device? I would hope not. <laughs> but but what she created was effectively the same thing. All the only difference is there there, there was a chemical reaction which liberated gas. By and God, the gas man, built you, up. You, but God, in, in man, no, it's no that. different than boil you know basically heating up that soda bottle and making it pop. By God, man, we could arrest everyone for that. Well, exactly. And somebody else pointed out you can do the same thing. Was it, I think, uh, Mentos and Diet some Coast. soda, <laughs> you know, um, or hell, the, the uh, uh, mixing uh, uh, vinegar and, uh, and baking soda will do a very similar thing. Not, obviously, not an explosive. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, that, that's, getting back to uh, the point of that, that would probably be one of the reasons is the discrepancies in language one reason or another that uh, I would almost be inclined to think that that leads to a lot of the uh, controversies in philosophical debate you know um, particularly when it comes to the speculative philosophies I don't know I would agree Um, but, again, I would uh, also say that this is where defining your terminology is important. 
And uh, thank you, DPR, for asking me what my definition of philosophy was uh, in order to discuss it. Because that is the important thing. What is the person, you know, what is the definition that the person has applied in their usage of the terminology? And the only way you can ascertain that is to ask them rather than take your interpretation of what they've said and then postulate against that. Well, you know, what's interesting you say that too, Brian, because uh, I think the, the other issue with the word philosophy, just like we're just talking about explosion and a lot of other words, there's a philosophy as if we were talking about um, these these fields of study uh, of, uh, and this view of, of how to... How to uh, You cut out there, Joe. Joe. Hello. Did he just mute himself? Yeah. You you've cut out there. Oh, Joe. I muted myself. Sorry. Uh, you know the colloquial sense of the word philosophy when when it just means someone's way of thinking. You know, you say, well, my philosophy is this. Well, they're not really a philosopher. They're not really talking about philosophy in the, in the sense that I think we're talking about here. It's just theirs, their personal view of the world. Yeah, but would you yeah, say the result? It, it's their thoughts as a result of the questions they've asked. To put right. it in the definition that we were discussing earlier, would right. you say? Would you say the reason, um, like Craig and such, use, um, well, philosophy? I mean, use science in their philosoph philosophical arguments, is because of the misconstruing of terms between the two fields. Well, the reason uh, that they no. use it, I, I think, is for credibility. I mean, it, it's much more easy to sound reliable if you're using a field that, you know, is regarded as being the most empirical, the most easily demonstrable. I mean, the, the better question yeah. is to ask is, um, you know, are they qualified necessarily to use it or are, you know, you know, what should be their methodology of using science, which I think is the more useful um, exploration. Yeah, I'd I'd have to agree with you. I'd say that, um, you know, uh, that forms the next phase of the discussion, dialogue, what have you. And that is, okay, you make an assertion. So the response to that is, well, what is your evidence for this assertion? Well, that's the problem. I mean, I think, uh, is DPR still there? Because, yeah. I mean, in my opinion, uh, I would say, I think, that philosophy doesn't present evidence, it presents arguments for, without evidence. It presents arguments, would you say? Much like religion. Yeah, that's kind of why well, I would say, that's, that's why I would say philosophy, my opinion with Steve going on that long rant a long while ago, it was just mumbo jumbo, like show me the evidence that will convince me. Don't just say, oh well, it's an argument and I have to convince it because of this thing called monus ponus. Well, fuck monus ponus. Monus ponus does not actually show that, oh, this is true. It just, if it logically follows, but how do you know it logically follows? Well, the scientific method doesn't show anything to be true until you stick something in it. Of course, that's but how that's it works. But that's the beauty same of science. Same thing with philosophy. The only problem is philosophy is a lot less rigid and what Yeah, counts. but the thing with philosophy, though, is you don't assert anything to begin with as evidence, and you don't go from that evidence to other bases. Well, sure you do. Like sure you what? do. Like what? Okay, well, um... Well, the, 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 the well, scientific no, but, method well, works on the basis that... You make an observation, you form a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, you test the hypothesis again, you revise your hypothesis, you test, retest, then you formulate a theory, and then you put that theory forward for evaluation. Yes. Yeah, so so the same thing, the same thing happens academically in the in philosophy, or so, should do, because so, you yeah. take you, you you take what's been established. And you expound upon it. Yeah, you generally right, start off. With, you start off with a few base assumptions of the same way you did with science, and you move on. Go ahead. DPR. Well, what does it get you? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I, I thought was one of the most wonderful arguments or answers I've ever heard from a philosopher, uh, A. C. Gray, um, when posed uh, the question, "Do we have free will?" Uh, rather than go into a cute diatribe, which I imagine that everyone in this panel is probably desperate to do, he simply answered it by saying, we must assume that we have and conduct our lives as if we have, and end up, that was it, because 
you know, where does it get us um, arguing endlessly about whether we have free will or not? It if we don't it have free will... It doesn't matter. And you philosophers just fucking love it. It's one of your great sort of like things you like talking about. So what whether we have it or not? Maybe I cannot control myself when I say I think the whole argument is shit. Maybe I'm pre... I don't have the free will not to say that. Maybe I do. I don't know. But where does it get us? Well, that's right, because if, if we don't have free will at all, then <laughs> there's literally nothing we could do about it. But the question is, how do you know you have free will? Well, you assume you have it anyway, because, well, I, I'm thinking. I don't yeah, know. Well, well, like I said, well, yeah, if, 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 you, if you have it, then you have it, and if you don't have it, there's nothing you can do about it anyway, so it's, it does become literally pointless. Yeah, but I would I would agree with you when it comes to you know uh, evaluating the utility of that particular uh, philosophical uh, discussion point. Oh However, you Let's can't you Let me can't just say take. Something. Hang on, you can't take uh, and uh, yeah, just briefly, but you can't take um, you know the lack of utility in one philosophical question to discredit philosophy as an entirety and say, oh, it has no utility. Because there I is utility and I did in not philosophy. No, 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 I know you didn't. I know you didn't. I'm so not, I'm going not on about it then. Let's you. move on. So I'm, just making, I'm just making the point that yes, there is are. utility Great. in let's other philosophical disciplines. Well, there's utility in this one even then. If we have free will, then punishment for punishment's sake is arguably valuable. If not, yes, then it's necessarily let's, let's it. without we value. Cannot, we, this that affects our judiciary as this pragmatic value. This goes back to the point that we were making before. We have to assume that people do have free will. That is the way we conduct ourselves in society. If it was possible for people to justify their actions by saying, well, I have no choice in it, then society would break down. So what, whatever the answer is, we do not accept free will as a justification for people to doing what they want to do. Without, without consequences. Uh, and, it go, and it goes it further than that. Yeah, right. it, it doesn't it, matter whether we have free will or not. We have to behave as, with, as if we do have free will. A, a DPR it goes even further than what you... I agree with what you just said, but it goes even further. Because if, think about this. If the, if the purpose of the trying to determine whether or not we have free will ha, has, is going to affect our decision on punishment, now think of this. If we're saying that people that do what they do have no choice because, it, it, because we don't have free will, that means if we punish them, we also did not have the free will not to punish them. Absolutely. Isn't Thank that you. a contradiction? It no, is a contradiction. It's not. Yes. It's not so a that's all. That's the whole point. It's basically say, so saying that we have to see if we, can, if, we, if we should be punishing people because they may not have the free will to do that well it's basically pointless because if there is literally no free will we don't whatever it means whatever we've done or do we didn't have any any free will which means even if we punish whether we punish somebody or not the act of doing that we also had no free will in that choice it means if we chose to punish somebody we did that without without free will as well in the same way that they did whatever they did without free will which means it's a pointless it's pointless to worry about it because it's not like you could change it because again if you have no free will then the discussion well, means nothing. Thank you for whilst I, whilst I would agree, I did, Joe. Yeah, whilst I would agree let me, let me with just, you both on the here. utility when it comes to legislation, when it comes to actual culpability, we and I think uh, you agreed with me earlier, DPR Jones, when I uh, when I suggested that there are genuine situations where you will find somebody who has fallen foul of the social and legislative contracts through no choice, no um, violation inherent within them. And that's, you know, through indoctrination or whatever was the example that I gave, yeah? So inherently, they are pre-programmed, predestined to be and function the way they have been programmed and indoctrinated. That, and recognizing, uh, recognizing that that does happen, okay, does not affect the overall point that you just made. But we do need to recognize that there are circumstances where somebody truly is lacking in the free will aspect of their situation. Right, right, Brian. But I, only have, I only have to accept that if I don't have free will. 
Okay, I'm gonna. Well, and that's the thing. Because that's kind of that's kind of the point. And you know, the, even even that, and I agree with you, Brian. There are there are circumstances in which a person may not have free will. They may have you know some sort of chemical imbalance, or you know they've been brainwashed or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, we're, that's that's a, a, a that's separate from the question of whether or not we collectively have free will. Um, and also, it assumes that we do because basically, it is setting aside an exception. To say certain individuals have their free will blocked, or taken away, or, or, or removed from them, or didn't weren't born with it for whatever reason, that's we're actually setting them out as, as an exception. So that even that assumption assumes that free will exists. I would agree with you. Yes. Yeah. And for, from the from the sake of utility, I would. Yeah, I do agree. Now, now the question is to, to know. We have okay. to act as though we do have free will. Right. Well, the question is, um, we, can we know that everyone has free will? Well, what would you say to that? Uh, well, can we know? I don't know. I, I don't think we can know. And that's another reason why it's kind of, you know, it might be, some people might find it interesting as a, as a you know, intellectual discussion, but in practice it has no value. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, like, you know, like when a theist says, oh, well, I know who made free will, it was God, but does God have free will then? Because if there's an exception to the rule, right? Well, and I, I also, too, I, I made, in, in the theistic sense, I made a video called The Trojan Horse of Free Will, uh, uh, and basic, uh, or The Trojan Horse, God's Gift of Free Will. And basically, I, I raised the point that if, if just say, take the, pretend for a second the theistic view is correct, that, that free will exists, but only in the context of God granting it to us, which really wouldn't make it free, but you know, we'll, we'll let that slide for a second. But if you think about it, what value, in, even in that context, does free will have? Because if you take, if you look at, okay, there's God's will, and then there's free, there's free, then there's free will. And if, you know, basically, you could, even without free will, you could do whatever God, you know, was within God's will, and you'd be fine. Which means that anything you've done that wouldn't be classified as sin would have been okay. So you didn't need free will to be able to perform those actions. The only thing free will grants you are the things that violate God's will. Well, which yes, means that yes. it can only condemn you. It can only condemn there's you. A, it has no positive value whatsoever. There's another aspect to this as well, Sirius, if I may. Um, and that is um, God has gifted us free will. Right. What sort of free will is this? Because at the same time as gifting us free will, he said, if you don't exercise it in the appropriate way, i.e. worship me, then I will torture you for eternity. Now, right. is that free? Is well, that exactly. Free it, will? It, it, it's not really free. Well, no. And, even if, and even, even if we see it through some lens, all it can do is condemn us. All it can do is, is, is make us, uh, allow us to do things that get us in, in the lurch. Well, that's well, the weird thing, you're a lawyer. I mean, that's... That I would have be to the say, there's someone in the chat, the the chat the, uh, saying that he wants to join. Um, oh, who wants to join? Yeah, I was going to say, do you want me to drop Some, so somebody he's, else he's can join? Um, I, um, oh, wait, and I, let me... I feel, let me. I, need, I feel as if I need a few more people on my side in this argument. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> okay, well, barely I'll, two of us. I'll drop so that Tom Tom can join you. Oh, it's Tom Tom? It's Tom... Is it yeah. the penguin guy? The penguin guy. Does he have a penguin as his picture? Because I think I got a met. Tom, Tom Piper. I'm not sure. I think I think it's. It's Tom it not is. Noid. I got a guy from. Tom Noid. Is that him? I'll drop so that you can pull him in. Okay. I, I mean, I'm just saying. I got this message from a guy named Tom Noid. I'm like, who the? I, d I do want though. Um, what just happened? Know, when he if he if he does join us. What just the first happened? Question has got to be, can he define philosophy? Wait, wait. Just to know what, what the fuck just happened. I mean. I just lost I Skype. Know. Who has Skype Premium? I thought someone here had... I, I do. That's what's really strange about it. Yeah, I was like, why the I fuck? Know. Why the fuck? I think Brian left. Because now it shows, like, you know, it's showing the, the boxes, which will mean that, you know, we won't see you in a few seconds. Um, I think we lost Brian, that's why. Perhaps, who knows? Well, that was just some bandwidth. I mean, it's fine. Well, I no, because really... TPRs, we got, a, we got a warning about not having premium. Yeah, I, yeah I, that's I, I, I got account. the warning. I... Uh, try it now. Oh, do, we have, I... do, do you have camera? Brian, do you have premium? 
Yeah, I do have premium. I, yeah, me. That's me. Uh, guest one, two, three, seven, six, one, four, five. Oh, so I dropped so Tom Tom could jump. Where's Tom Tom? Yeah, I thought you were going to invite him because he wanted to. Uh, Is it Tom actually, actually, I got I got to drop anyway because I got to I got to take my wife to the airport. But uh, but thanks for having me in, guys. Okay, we'll talk to you later. Um, uh, Tom, uh, right, did, he send, did he send a request to me, or just, do you have his request, Brian? No, the the request is in the chat room. I uh, I don't know, I I don't know what his on... name is. I don't know what is what's your Skype. I don't have him on Skype. Wait, I'll just do this. Shit, this is getting annoying. I'm just gonna let's see. Here it is. There it is. Call Sir Strife to join the combo there. Okay. What were we talking about before we got derailed? Um, something about theist arguments of free will and shit. Oh, I was going to say that uh, it's not really free will because as DPR would oh, it acknowledge is the penguin as a guy. lawyer. It is the penguin guy. I, I guess. You know. Or the bots. Do go on to strike. I thought you were going to support me for a moment. Uh, oh, with the free will thing? Oh, well, I, I would agree with what, um... Um, with what, uh, what was he said? With, um, with, um, what, uh, uh, give me a second. I, I just Where's forgot. Uh, the guy who just left. I forgot his name already. Um, um, the whole serious thing. Serious Mind. That, yeah, Serious Mind with the whole thing that pretty much the free will thing. Hold on. If you had free will, then you could do any, that means you have the will to go against God by default. You can go against God because you have the freedom too. If you just if you're a robot and God told you to do whatever He wills, then you cannot go against God. Therefore, nothing God bad could happen. Whatever He wills, then you cannot go against God. Therefore, nothing bad can happen. Yeah, can you can you mute the can you mute the uh, video? Hello. Yeah, can you, can you mute the can you mute the uh, video? There's another there's another issue as well though, uh, to try, but Apparently, you can't sing. In uh, heaven, so does that mean that your free will is taken from you? Well, you that's a good question. Like I've heard few responses to that. I heard um, you're not you when you go to heaven. That's one. Two, um, they don't know what happens in heaven. And I think three is um, um, yeah, I think that's it. I just feel like heaven's really a bummer type of place because all the interesting people that I know would definitely not make it into heaven. We'll be in hell. Yeah, I mean, what is it? It's heaven for the climate, hell for the company. Also, we have uh, another caller. By, by, have, wow, the way that uh, heaven has been described to me um, would be for me uh, hell. And there are also away. questions that you can ask about heaven, which um, um, no one can possibly answer. It's certainly not in the Bible, and so any answer that you do receive is a creation of a uh, utter imagination. Uh, how old are you in heaven? Do you get older in heaven? If you die as a child and you go to heaven, do you actually grow up? And if so, to what age? Can you choose what age? Can I therefore be in a position in heaven where I have chosen my age, which is older than my mother, so I'm looking at my mother as a younger person than me. I mean, all these sort of like questions, as I said, you'll never get an answer for the Bible or any other literal um, well, text. Well, yeah, so because, because remember, be you're, you're reading to someone's imagination. If anyone ever dares to answer any of those questions, call them out as a complete fraud. Well, you're running, you're, you're actually, it seems like to me, you're, um, you're actually, um, reading too much into the details, you know, just say, go with what the story says, you know, just yeah. don't overthink the story, just go with what it the says. The story doesn't say anything. Read the Bible. It does not it's, say anything. About I know, that's like, that's like reading too much into, it's like, that's like reading too much into Lord of the Rings, and you're like, oh, well, uh, what happens to Frodo when they go to the uh, lands of the West where the elves are living immortally far? You know, like, it's well, like there's saying, a difference, there's a minor difference between the Lord of the Rings and the Bible. People don't bet. Well, some people. people Lord don't of the Rings. Their entire well, ethical system on Lord of the Rings, do they? Is Hell in the Tunnel? I realise that's slightly. It's more than that as well, isn't it? Um, the Lord of the Rings isn't riddled with inconsistencies. Well, yes, because it was written by the same guy, and then it was wrote, written by his son. Exactly. That's the point. 
And the Lord of the Rings is really well written as well, which which is a major difference. Has a good plot too. I, I tried reading that so many times and never got to it. I, I'd have to disagree with that. I was able to read the Bible a lot easier. I never read the Bible. I, I have all the Lord of the Ring books. I've read them. Oh, I couldn't. I tried tried four times and gave up. Once once I get to the genealogies, the I start different. falling asleep. What? When I get to the genealogies in the Bible, I just start falling. They have, oh, a, they have, I guess a gene- have to sort of skip through a bit. I, I think I think of the last page of the uh, Return of the King, which pretty much says what happens after that book. It says you know like like it says King. Uh, oh fuck, what's his name? The, the the main guy, not not Frodo, but the other guy, uh, the king, the the human dude. Uh, Aragorn. Yes, Aragorn. God, why did I forget that? Yeah, like it says he dies, and then the elf chick who he um. Who he had kids with and stuff. She died of sorrow, and Frodo went to the lands of the West, and and so did um, Gollum and Le- and Legolas, like all that stuff. Like you know, I was like, okay, that's a happy ending, I guess. Hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, speaking of happy endings, I'm gonna have to. Uh, Drop and uh, get on and do some things. So, uh, so there goes Sky Premium. Yeah, uh-huh. sorry guys. Um, <laughs> I have but, Sky uh, Premium. It is what it is. Who does? I do. And I'll, I'll, I'll sing you a special round of Sucks to Be You next Friday's Fail. <laughs> <laughs> right. Take it easy. Always okay, see you, Brian. Brian have a glorious weekend. And gentlemen. we have now an empty Bye. slot for anyone who wants to be in the uh, chat. And possibly get us to the number of second slot in the uh, Vaughn Live scale, I guess, because we're number ten. Oh, you know that? Ten. Know? We're number ten. Is that it? What? Oh, uh, I thought we were like first at one point. No, we were never. We're we're in the top ten though. That's not bad. I can see. I, I can see just. You see all these pictures up there. Yeah, I see the picture of the Lion Ghost Show, don't just you? The Lion Ghost Show. Yeah, we're still there. We're at one. We're like the number <laughs> eleven. So we're, the, we're. You can see us without scrolling. So DPR, what what else do you so want to say? Up. Oh, go ahead. We're well, going to say the chat's kind of moved on, so we move with the chat. Okay, now they're talking about athe- atheism well, plus. D- DR, DPR, what do you think about feminism? Oh God. Oh Jesus. This can go one of two ways. We can like, be talking about one of two types of feminism. Well, let's see. Let's see what DPR we goes. About, we're going to we're going to go where he goes. Let's just well, let's be let's understand what we're on about. Do we mean the batshit crazy Shamalif Firestone? We need to destroy all men feminism. Or and the fe- women are better than men feminism, or the liberal feminists who aren't really feminists, but just liberals who believe that we should have equal rights. So pretty much they're a bunch of damn hippies. I, I hate both of them. One of them because it's not a position that's new. The other one because it's just batshit crazy. Um, we lost... let's see here. Um, yeah, I know that. Um, so pretty much, um, DP, are you there? TPR? TPR? Give me 10 minutes, I'll be back. Oh. <laughs> well. Do we have to... I, I don't know why people are being so obsessive about feminism. And... Uh, personally. I mean, it... It... it uh, the... The people on both sides that are radicals on either side uh, bother me to no end. I would say I'm all for equality, but when you have to put a name before the ism, I think it's sort of defeating the purpose. Well, I yeah, mean... I mean, equality is known as liberalism. You have a... No, you have a liberal, no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, I mean well, actual the liberalism, point. not the American understanding of liberalism, right. to be clear. There's a difference... Okay. But the American understanding of liberalism, which is liberalism of a specific type, and then there's the universal understanding of liberalism, which is the idea that everyone is an individual who deserves equal foundational rights, such as the right to um, freedom of expression, etc. Yeah, I could subscribe that. Yeah. I do get annoyed about American politics so much. I'm not a, there are a lot of things I'm not a fan of. It's amazing to watch, but... I, I just don't I don't like men's rights activists I don't like radical feminists. What about, what about gay rights activists? Isn't that true? that's totally different though? I don't, wait 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 how's that kind of different? It's yeah, like, I'm just using that. Because they're trying to win the oppressed. 
it's, because it's similar foundational. It's still the type of there's legal no issue. legal yeah. right now. There's no legal difference between men and women. Now there well, are other. Well, you can make it to, so, to be fair. Yeah, there kind of fair, is. The, the, since the forties and fifties, the political philosophies changed the phrases. The personal is the polit. Sorry, the personal is the political. It's the idea that the culture we have specifically has created the sticky floor and glass ceiling. I was going to say there's an example of... We can't no, I know, I know get up from minimum wage and break into the highest I, ends of jobs. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I, I would just... I, I'd like to finish my thought. Um, Sorry. Because you kind of cut me off and I... What I was saying is there's no... The difference between gay rights activists and radical feminists and men's rights activists, and I say radical feminists because most mainstream feminists are nothing of the sort of some of the people who are making the most noise, which is unfortunate. But the issue is, on either side, is that gay rights, they're, they're legally gays are not equal to, to um, straight people. Legally, in the books, they're not equal. However, men and women technically are equal in terms of their legal standing. The reason that I don't like radical feminists or men's rights activists is because their perceptions about what equality is, what it is in our society, are just so drastically um, and, and so ridiculously unfounded sometimes. Um, you know, for, for example, whenever anyone... My eyes always glaze over when someone says something like, ma like male privilege or uh, feminine privilege or something like that because it's... It's so silly because they refu They want to look at ideologies rather than facts, my opinion. Well, I was going to say, um, like, what do you mean by men and women are the same? Like, I remember I was seeing a documentary or something about it where women are trying to have, like, you know, men can walk around shirtless while women can't. Is that, is, would you say that they're equal in that part? Well, how do you mean? Could you rephrase the question? I just said that men can walk around shirtless, women can't. Um, I think that's just childish. I don't know if that's necessarily an equality thing. That's what mean, America. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, there's a movement, I think, of women that are, want to pretty much be able to go topless. Which, I, I mean, mean, I mean, honestly... In Europe, in Europe, you can't on the beach. There's no, there's no problem. Personally, I mean, I think that that's a society thing. I, I don't necessarily... So is uh, gay rights a society you say thing? It's a culture no, thing. but... There's a legal thing with gay. There's a legal part to gay rights, and then there's a societal part to uh, gay equality. Well, um, let me let me go for an example. Um, a couple of days ago, when I was going up a pub, I saw a bloke walk down um, the street, and I know I know him. He's a doctor. He's gay. And about five or six blokes were shouting at him, kids with his partner, shouting "fag," "twat," "gay," and just throwing stuff at him. Now, would you say, ignoring the throwing stuff at him, because that obviously is legally wrong, the freedom to say that is protected. Would you say that gay, um, gay rights lobbyists have a just cause for campaigning and saying this is wrong and this needs um, address in society, whether it's through law to stop it, or, and this is more popular, through an actual cultural change through um, education to promote the idea of equality. Well, I would say that they're just... I mean, there's no reason that that shouldn't be... If, 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 there's, if you're lobbying for gay equality, um, and that applies beyond legal standing, then yes, of course you want to push education about that. You can't legislate against ignorance. It's, that's just not the way that it works. And I would say that, you know, as far as trying to get legal redress for what they're doing, well, you can stop the assault, you can, you know, you can only do so much from a legal standpoint. But yes, I'd say that they're, of course, justified in campaigning for education. You can change, well, you can have affirmative but you action. can't change what people think. Exactly. Well, you can have, that, you can have affirmative longer. action, you could use... Yeah, it take, takes a lot longer for people to change their attitudes than the law. Definitely takes longer, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Oh yeah, it was I mean, worth doing. It's it definitely out. worth doing, but it is a long process. I went through this in Northern Ireland. It takes a long, awful long time. I mean, the issue that comes up a lot is um, 
affirmative action is the American term, positive discrimination. Yeah, Maybe what's yeah your I, I don't feel very good about affirmative action personally. Um, and, and part of that is my experience with working with people who are in underrepresented groups is they don't like it. And this is not all, like, by no means is this the majority. This is only people I've worked with is they tend to say that, well, this is bullshit because I'm not, you know, they're judging me for being, you know, black or being, you know, whatever race or Hispanic well, actually or there is it gay. Oh, well, and oh, well. I, can I finish the, okay, go ahead, go ahead. the sentence? Go ahead, and then, go ahead. Uh, and they, they think, oh, well, you know, I don't need anyone's help to achieve what I'm achieving. And so that's one of the reasons that, to some degree, I have a problem with affirmative action because it's societally it's demeaning towards um, underrepresented groups. I was going to say, so, sorry, um, oh, there's actually it's, okay. it's um it's dis how's it uh, weakening these groups by giving them more chances than men, for example, if we go with women. Well, the issue is, is like I said, it, they view it as demeaning because they say, this is, this is only from my experience of interacting with people, and there's a bit of literature to suggest this, though by no means is it the majority, is that even though you're getting redress, the issue is that, um, the, the issue chiefly is, is that they believe that they can achieve on their own, and that by legally placing them in that place, you are forcing... They, they get the treatment from a lot of other people that, oh, this is an affirmative action fire, uh, or hire, excuse me. I'm harder to be fired because I'm affirmative action rather than being held to the same standard of everyone else. That's well, the, the reason why standard, a lot of people but the same fight. standard But the standard without affirmative action is women being discriminated against. It's not only women. If there's, if, that's I'm not what I'm, is, I'm not the point, saying that this I understand is the truth. The point. I'm saying this is how people feel. So... Yeah. Before you go off, you got to actually realize what I said. Yeah. yeah it's not always the case. Uh, we, we had affirmative action uh, in our country because there was a massive underrepresentation by one religion as opposed to another in the police force. And there was everybody objected to it in the beginning about the affirmative action. But it's worked. It really has worked. It's made the police force much more balanced much for everybody's agreed that it was a, the right thing to do. So there, it does have its place. It's not always the case, but you can't, it's not black and white. There's not never black and white in life. There's areas that are gray, and this is one of them, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, this is very important now because recent, as recent as 2011, I think it is, uh, the unit, European Union has been passing gender equality laws to promote quotas in high-end businesses to promote affirmative action. Yeah, because I mean, the, the problem issue is, is... The system's is already a bias against women, or bias against blacks, or bias against any group. You need affirmative action in order to counter that. I mean, it's not a case of putting it, putting the scale in favour of women. That's it's not putting a scale true. that's already in favour of men more towards the centre. His, historically, that's not actually very true. Um, just to counter that, there's not too much evidence that affirmative action you know, is is really the reason why these, or or is even a solution. Um, if you look at something like, let's say, um, in the United States, I don't know how familiar you are with the history here, but Catholics used to not be considered white in the United States in the early um, eighteen, early mid and late eighteen hundreds. They were considered the equivalent of maybe not being black, but it, it was the equivalent of being of a different race. They were not. They were not considered white. However, over time, it generally got, and the same, of course, of Jews, but to be said of Jews and various other, you know, ethnic groups. But what happened over time is they gradually became accepted into what is white. What is considered white in America now is not what was considered white 200 years ago. And that's an interesting distinction. And that was done entirely um, through society just organically changing. In the same way, I would say that more has been done for gay equality than, you know, is not hate crime legislation, but the fact that the newer generations are growing up understanding that gays are equal to straight people. 
Can I um, say something which I've no which I f found out recently about the medical system? Really interesting thing. If there's this thing called Action Thirty Four, which is um, if you're if, on this test, if you want to donate blood, there's a question that says, "Have you slept with a man in the last X amount of years?" It doesn't matter any ma years. It's, it's pretty much for life. And if you check yes, they cannot. You cannot donate blood, even though all blood gets gets checked for HIV. That's what the thing's for, a fear of HIV. But it makes no sense, because, you know, you know, you'd be able to check, wouldn't you? So women cannot donate blood, then? It says man. It doesn't say, it says male. Is this, if you, if you slap with a man, so a woman cannot donate blood? This is for males only. It was a males, they have one for women. They have one for women, though. I just don't remember. I just remember what the male one says. So what, that, that, that should be illegal by the fact that it's discrimination and sexist. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I get the, I get the idea was, I get the, I get the idea of it was like I think it was in back in the '80s when H, when AIDS and HIV was prominent in homosexuals. Now it's prominent in my, minority uh, women. I think it was that, that I heard from a, so they had a protest thing in the same place. This was in my school. It was a whole thing about donating blood. The point is, at the time, it was very difficult to test for it, and so that's a yes. cheap, easy way of doing it. But obviously now, it's just. A, a, a way of being sexist rather than anything. I mean, I'm trying to. F I mean, what is it in the UK? The UK, UK has one year now. Um, and it's just something that you can use easily to discriminate. Yeah, but the problem is, though, you, you for life, meaning if you ever want to donate blood, you can never donate blood if you're homosexual, pretty much. Ever. Well, you can just not have sex for a year. No, 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 no. And here, no, I'm saying it's for life. Uh, not in the UK. Not wait, in many. Wait, wait, wait! You tell me. You tell me if you have sex and if you're homosexual and you have sex, and one year later you can donate blood. In Italy and Spain, you can have sex the day before. It's only in, it must only be in the United States that it's that big. Let me just check. Um, I don't get it though. I don't get it though. Like, what is the thing about? Yeah, United States indefinite. Yeah. If you work, if you work with radiation, you cannot donate blood in the UK. So they're no, discriminating against quite... people who work with 3D. <laughs> that's quite but it's okay. It's okay. Everything else is fine. Well, I mean, I mean, it, you could. I mean, if you honestly answer the question honestly, I mean, you could lie, but you know, would you want to be honest or would you not want to be honest? That that is one of the funniest things I've ever questions I've ever, ever had. The first time I went to the states, and every time I've gone since, but the first time I went, they said, "Have you ever been co convicted of a criminal offence?" Have you, have you ever been involved with drugs? They ask you these and the, the visa on the way in. Why would anybody say yes? <laughs> I mean, I mean, they're questionnaires which are kind of like, hey, you, if you want to lie, uh, go ahead, you know? Just add, well, like, I mean, like, you're under penalty of perjury. You're at no. pe under penalty of perjury, though, so you can serve time in prison if you're, if you're lying yeah. about it. How, they how, how are they ever going to find that? Seriously. How there's, would they? there's hundreds of thousands of people going in to Florida alone in a year. They're never going to check. Realistically. But I, I was wondering what you guys thought of when I gave the... It's very interesting, especially for European people, because there's not such a dynamic about race as there is in the United States. What you guys thought about my, my example of how Sorry? the definition of white has changed for people over... Uh, over, you know, the course of a couple hundred years, because when I became privy to this, I, I was fortunate to have a very, very good U.S. history teacher. Um, it, to me, I found it very, very fascinating. Uh, we, Sorry, our, we, we, we have in our country, left. we discriminated against people who were white, you know, for a long time. So the fact that, you know, people of different color would discriminate against each other is neither here nor there. Bristol Bay successfully discriminating against the Catholics. Yeah. Just want to point that out. We're very good at that. Yeah. No, I mean, what about the Protestants? You, okay. Even now we're doing very well. I don't know how against discriminating against people from other countries. Yeah. I do love UKIP. UKIP's a fun po party. I still really you, well the I've met Nigel. Nigel's a great bloke. He has just no understanding of how politics works. As in literally no understanding. I mean, he, he doesn't understand the current bloody electoral system we have. He's confusing first past the post, which is what we currently have, is the same in the United States, uh, with AMS, which is what Germany has, with AV+, Plus, which is what he wants, which he says Germany has, which he says the United States has had, 
um, and but has never been tried out anywhere. It has. Ever. Northern Ireland has had the full PR for the last 20 years. Sorry, free PR for STV. No, P- the same uh, thing. P- proportional representation. Oh, yeah. So there's less. Yeah. Uh, the full full list. I can so start trans- speaking and acting in here now. It's a full transferable. You know, so you need a quota to get in. Once you get the yeah. quota, any leftover goes to whoever's second on that kind. So it's full transferable vote. Mm. Except so, um, for Westminster elections where it's first past the post. We DPR, did you vote yes? Not yesterday, two days ago. I think he's away. Oh, vote yes. Yeah. Oh. Who for? Oh, I didn't vote. Sorry. Oh. I thought oh. you said I vote yes, as if it was some form of <laughs> Damn it, DPR! You're oh. damn. You're damn. You oh, don't vote. Reference. You don't vote. Well, it was town council, so it's not no, the biggest I, I didn't vote. Oh, I thought. I thought he's like. Vote. I don't vote, even though I live in a country where I have the privilege to vote. I haven't voted for years. There's no point. In where I come from, there's no point in voting because you're I'm a damn Scottish. communist. Then I'm well, saying. I, I, I no, think, uh, I was just thinking are about you not Scottish. Because, sorry. No. Uh, sorry to cut through you. I was, I was just thinking about <laughs> it. Sorry, you sound gay. Though. I, had a yeah. I was thinking about this. Um, you know, we had elections in this country, which um, were not of great significance so far as the political climate is going <coughs> to has any effect. But um, there were sort of like local elections, and what I found interesting was uh, that a lot of people had voted for a party that had been like pretty much dismissed as jokers and clowns, which is a kind of right-wing party that basically once out of Europe and whatever. I was just curious to ask um, Steve what, what what his views are of it were. Do you think that this was just sort of like a, a protest vote or do you think that um, it's going to have knock-on effects such as Cameron having to accept that there's going to have to be a referendum earlier than he planned on Europe? It's going to be both, I think. I think firstly it was definitely, 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 definitely a uh, protest vote. It was a two two maybe three prong the um protest vote a protest vote against the current mainstream parties all getting too close to the center a protest vote against the europe almost trying to lord over the united kingdom which just isn't true but still and a protest against um just the politics in general because we lost the lib dems it's very hard to have a protest vote for the lib dems when they're in power they're the ones who's ballsing things up now but yeah, I mean, if you don't know, if you don't know who the United, the U- UK are, the United Kingdom Independence Party in the chat, they're the party, they're essentially the Republicans, but the British version. And I say that. No, really I, well, I, I would not say that. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty much a mischaracterization of the Republican Party. Oh yeah, they're not that far right wing, to be fair. Well, I think there's, there's, like that is, there's one thing that is similar between the two, and. Um, it's this, if nothing else. Um, both parties seem to deny global warming. Yes. Well, they both seem to blame everything on the immigrants as well. That'd be the other thing. I mean, Jesus Christ, how many shit? How much shit can you lay on the Romanians? Well, I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know. That, I, I, I have to say, I, I, I take issue with you here, Steve. They, I think they've been very careful in the way that they've presented their arguments, and I don't think that they've actually complained about immigrants. And this is what sort of like separates them from the more extreme sort of like British Nationalist Party and whatever. Um, what they've done is basically focused, um, and I think cunningly, focused their complaints about the European Union. And I think that that has actually won them a lot of the support because we have always uh, been a very reluctant partner um, into the European community or the European Union. Um, and I think... I, as I say, I think that is probably why people are backing them. And they've sold that argument very well. And no political party, ever since we joined back in 1973, has actually managed to sell Europe to the British electorate. Mm. I, I, just out of curiosity, what is the British relationship with the EU? I mean, wasn't the EU after World War II or something? I, like, I forget. Do you want a very right. brief history? If yeah, because I, I have no idea. I just know the you European Union. Right. Right. Um, it, 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 it all started off after the uh, World War II. And um, 
it was hoped that in order to prevent further wars, particularly between France and Germany, for example, which had had three or four wars in the last uh, previous hundred years, that this shouldn't happen again. So this idea that, you know, let's all join in as a community. And it started with the Treaty of Rome back in 1957, which joined uh, six countries together in this sort of like economic... Um, so in a commonwealth, unity. right? No, nothing like it. It was a purely uh, economic... Isn't that uh, what a commonwealth is? No. no. A commonwealth is totally different. Don't let, let me deal with one at a time. <laughs> yeah. The European Union started off Treaty of Rome, 1957, six countries. It's expanded subsequently. Um, the United Kingdom has always been somewhat reluctant to join. Uh, but in the <coughs> excuse me, the early um, 70s, or well, late 60s, early 70s, it decided, hang on a second, maybe the common market, which was a purely uh, economic sort of like entity, they thought, hang on, we, perhaps we ought to join. And um, in the early 70s, I'd say we did join. And in the Labour government um, of 74 to 79, things were going somewhat harmoniously um, with Europe. But then Thatcher came in, and Thatcher who was not particularly agreeable with Europe and its ideas. Um, things Slight like understatement. That, and since then, we've always had this dodgy sort of like relationship. The European Union, or community as it was known then, now the European Union, um, sort of like has gained numbers. It's now up to 27 countries. And basically, uh, the idea is that um, it's a free trade zone. It's a way it was initially sold. Um, so trading um, between countries would be made a lot easier. And that for, therefore, you know, it would um, encourage all sorts of things, such as um, economic uh, progression and um, high levels of employment and all this sort of nonsense. I don't, but I don't, want, they, they, I don't they, want their period. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end. I'm coming to the end. Right, right, right. Don't worry. Um, but subsequently, they've also introduced uh, certain social elements to it, which um, have caused a lot of problems. So the, the European Union is a collection of disparate countries that geographically are centered around the same sort of place, but uh, politically don't have the same sort of like um, harmonious views, so to speak. And Britain has always been sort of like an outsider, part of it, but an outsider. Pretty much like the US is part of international justice. It likes to be on the outside. He doesn't want to be part of it, but he wants to be able to control things. Fuck you guys, we're on an island. Sorry, I just want to, just want to, very, very well done, DPR, but there's a couple of things. Uh, Harold Wilson tried to get in and charged the goal, wouldn't let the Brit British in. And then it was actually Edward Heath that took us into the European Union. Yeah. Yeah, well, he went, he, he, even yes, then. he did. The I, I party was with that. He went cup in hand to fucking yeah. France, who, who yeah. basically said, no, we're not having England. He had yeah. paint, or sorry, ink thrown at him when he went to France. I mean, all sorts of things. It was a great, great struggle. For um, you to get the only referendum we have ever had in this country, 1975, was about whether we should be a member of the European Union or not. So yeah, yeah I sorry, say again. The right? only referendum we've had in this country was in 1975. About Europe, yes. Oh, about Europe. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I mean the thing is, the reason why it happened is because the United Kingdom was so, di the Parliament was so divided and partly so divided on whether we should be in or out that it almost threatened to shut down Labour. And it's, it's, like it's, Labour. It has torn the Conservative Party apart. And Conservatives, uh, yeah. Ever since. But what other, what other referendums have we had? Well, um, Northern Ireland had a uh, referendum, but and the, the Republic, yeah, yeah, the Good Friday Agreement, so that was the, the, yeah. yeah, the Welsh um, devolution, which failed miserably, the Scottish devolution, Scotland which succeeded fantastically. Happened. And the Scottish one in 2014, the AV election in 2011, um, there's a load of more um, local mayor elections, referendums, there's a lot of them. There's not as many as they should be, I'll be fair, but there's a fair few. I mean, the problem is, of course, UKIP... Well, hang on, I mean, hang on, the, hang town on council the, the Welsh referendum was something exclusive to Wales, was it not? Yes. The Scottish referendum was exclusive, exclusive Scotland was it not? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me one, one national 
that is hey, the United alternative vote. referendum that is taking place apart from the one in 1975. Alternative vote 2011, only a few years ago. The so we have to look about, I have a, the 2011 um, AV referendum. It was part of the, the, the Conservative and Liberal Democrats. Well, it wasn't what really. It annoys me oh, so yeah. much. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. I'm I made them you, yeah. sold out. I made them sold out on that. That pissed me off so much. I so loved you. I loved Lib Dems until Mick Craig decided to absolutely destroy the party. I mean, oh. people say Obama. People say Obama's just um, aims to destroy America. Look how Nick Clegg is doing it. He's got a better shot. Look how he's doing it with Lib Dems. I do not like Nick Clegg. Up there yeah, but Sam. why do you think I'm a fan? Destroy the party. Why? Because he's gone. Okay, because the Lib Dems are protest party, so they do best when outside of power. Uh, so they shouldn't on, have done a coalition. Single, every single party political party has as its ambition to have some um, play in the power. Yes, and so Clegg, but Clegg managed to do that um, with the coalition government that we have uh, now. But how, how can you criticise him for that? Because it's too short, because it's short term looking. What will happen now is after 2015, the Lib Dems will lose, go into obscurity and never win power again. If they consolidate it, then they could have kept going with the protest party, keep getting more and more votes, especially in the time of crisis. Consolid consolidated about what? Just consistently just gone about how they should have kept consolidating as a protest party, keep gaining votes, well, if keep formulating stronger policy. They weren't really always a protest, protest party. party. You're never going to get into well, they power. No be. political party ever wants to be someone that's a protest party. They want no, to be but, power. But if I could say, but I would say, let me put it this way. I mean, this is my opinion and you can disagree with it, fine. But I would say if you, they waited five years to 2015, they would have had a lot longer run in a time of coming out of a recession into a boom and thus having more support as a party. That's my opinion on it. You can disagree, but that's fine. On top I of disagree. that, okay, on top is. of that, I would say they went in with the wrong party because the Lib Dems have always been more ideologically aligned with the Labour. They tried it with Labour before and it was a disaster. How, how long ago are we talking? Uh, I think it was in the 80s. Oh, we're talking about, ah, that's the minority the government of um, Callaghan, was yeah, it? Yeah, Cal Cal Callaghan second stint. Uh, well yeah, I wouldn't pass that. Sorry, uh, no, I think you're, you're talking about the, the Lib Lab. Um, yeah. I would say, for one, they didn't even have enough power because they're still a couple of seats short. They needed independence to do anything. Um, and coalitions in almost all the time SLP, has gone very go. badly. And there's been, ever been a good coalition or minority government short of rainbow coalitions in our history. Yeah, I think you're going back to 1974 though. You're talking of Jeremy Thorpe times, aren't you? Sorry, are you talking about... When I'm thinking of rainbow coalitions, I'm thinking of the um, world wars. Sorry, I was no, talking no, about... Was oh, wait, so I'm curious though, why did Britain join the UN? I mean, honestly, I mean... It, why? Because we basically had a major role in setting it up. We made a fair bit of it into our favour. That's, that's why we got a permanent seat. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Why did we join the UN? No, no, I mean like this, like this. It, 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 like, the UN, yeah. in a sense, is a power greater than Britain, right? In a sense, it, it's... In a sense, it's uh, in a sense, it's a power greater and at the same time a power less than. Yes, yes, yes. But I mean, if we tell the United Nations not to do something, they will not do something. And, and also, you have to look at it this way. Uh, it was set up in such a way that five uh, countries had effective control and let me finish please to a large degree they still do and the idea of not joining would be more repulsive I mean would you sort of like not join something where you're gonna say yeah I've got my ace up my sleeve and I can veto anything you like there are, there are five um, members of the or top members of the Security Council United States France Great Britain China and Oh shit! I forgot what. Uh, Russia? Russia. 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 Yes. Thank Soviet you. Russia. Yeah. Soviet Union. So all of the all of them have a veto. That you're going to say, oh well, I'm not going to join this club that may have some effect. Oh, I'll tell you what. Sure. I know. Just join it, and I'll, I'll I'll have I'll have that yeah. seat on the chair that says, yeah, I can veto whatever the fuck I like. Of course I don't understand the question. I was saying this. I was saying this. If if Britain had such a problem with the UN. Well, I mean, with the he EU, didn't. EU, EU, not UN. Okay. Why would they have a, I mean, wouldn't they have a problem then with the e, with the UN, in a sense? 
No, because the uh, EU was totally, um, a minor. Totally different yeah. things. The United Nations and the, um, the uh, European Union are just so. I mean, the United Nations acts as a general uh, global, uh, uh, a really general global the force country. for humanitarian intervention, while the EU is a force for unifying and consolidating and um, arguably, if you listen to some of the far right, um, controlling Europe. I mean, they've got completely different aims. The UN was set up by the winners of the Second World War, basically. It was the four, yeah. it was four started off. It was Stalin, FDR, Churchill and the the go sat around the table at Potsdam and said, "This is the way it's going to you be." Mean, you mean the um the uh, what's it called the um oh my god I know it the um uh, that hotel. Yes. Was it basically the thrust it all out and this this is the way it's going to be and China came in later because you couldn't ignore them. And that was it. Yeah, you could. You can ignore Canada. China. Oh, I think it's uh, Canada. China, I'm, like, I'm like Canada. What are you on about? I think it's Canada. <laughs> Like yeah, let's ignore Canada. But yeah. um, but yeah um, yeah. what's the, what's the group doing? Yeah, oh here's the Yalta Yalta conference. Yeah, it was um, puffed on Yalta. Was well, the Yalta yeah. conference didn't That's set the up the United conference. Nations. Did. No, the Yalta conference was what we what happened to post-war uh, Europe, I thought, right? Yes. Yeah, but it's it's got nothing to do. It, to be honest, it's got very little to do with the United Nations and the way that was set up. I would say the United Nations had more to do with Woodrow Wilson's idea of the League of Nations, but but it. You know, wouldn't yes, be fair. It, it, it basically it, it, it took over the League of Reason, uh, the League of Nations. <laughs> League, League of Reason, Reason. <laughs> that'd be fantastic. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, uh, that that had been established, um, I think, in fact, before even the First World War, if not shortly after the First World War. But um, the League, um, League of Reason, League of Nations, yeah. basically um, came the United Nations. But it wouldn't have happened. That's the topic. Is the you and a force for good? Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> there, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of creations. Um, uh, other people, in Macedonians, who wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for the UN. I mean, my question is. Um, I'm Sudanese. I mean, what part of Britain? What part of Britain are you from, Tom? Uh, Northern Ireland, which is. Ah. The north part of Ireland. Oh wait, didn't weren't you on last time when I asked you which which is more free? Yes, ah. you, you were trying yes. to say yes, uh, I asked were, yes. were not non free being in the north. Yeah. At some point you were under British uh jackboot. Well you know. when you're under somebody's occupation, isn't that mean then you're not free? We're not under an occupation. Are, yeah, are you, mean, what, what you state is the British military Spain. there? What, what what state are you from in America? Um it's from a king. guess the name. Uh, okay, let's see. Virginia? There's a king named Virginia. A king? <laughs> Charles Tom. No, wait, no, wait, it's a duke. A duke. Not a king, a duke. Oh, no idea. A duke? A duke? Yes. It's, a, it's one of the letters, of, it's one of the last letters of the English alphabet. There's not that many letters at the end Wisconsin? of the alphabet. Wisconsin? What? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wisconsin? No. Wicature? No. I don't know. Washington? No. <laughs> Getting close to the letter, though. Is it a W? Yes. No, no, it's, it's not, oh, not a W. For fuck's sake, what's wrong with you? Is it a W? I don't know what? my own state. Duke of York. Yorktown. New York. Oh, New York, New York. Right. fine. Right. I don't know nothing are, about are you, are you under Are you under uh, occupation by Washington? That's the government. Are you under occupation by Washington? That's the question. No. I don't, right. have, I don't, right. I don't, have, the, I don't have the American army um, outside my window and shit. Exactly. Ah, well, well, we are part. We are. We are. We are a state in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I'll so we, that we are state. state. Of being, I'm, I'll assume that means you're a unionist. No. I'm well, not a unionist. What am I on about? I, I'm not. I'm a no. Shit, wrong one, I, I, I'm a Protestant, but I'm not a. I, I, I'm a Protestant unionist Republican. Work that one out. Okay, um, can give me a minute. I mean, wait. I remember. I, I, I heard. Okay. Oh, Republican I, I, I was born a Protestant. I am a Unionist. Yeah. Well, stop. Republic. Stop. Stop. <laughs> You're born a Protestant, You're he's going to say. born a Protestant. You're born an atheist. I'm an Ireland. You are an Ireland. My, my, my parents were both Protestants. You feckin' were an Ireland. Yeah. I... I... I'm a Unionist because I believe we're better off in the Union of 
United Kingdom, but I am a Republican. So don't don't believe don't the family it's a, re way to it's a Republican a, tradi a traditionalist in Britain just like it is in America or no? Yeah, there yes, are people in the United tradition Kingdom. in the United Kingdom to have a republic and not a monarch. There are there are about thirty percent of people who would rather have a republic in the United Kingdom. Really? The figure is yeah. that high. Yeah, it's about that. Sorry, that board. It's one of the issues that actively apathetic. There's a few issues which politically I'm actively apathetic about, and this is one of them. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I was gonna say, like, so, so, are you a traditionalist or no? Would you be classified as? I'm, I, I, I come from a mixed marriage. Is what we call. A mixed Wait, what, marriage. Did, what did you just say, Steve? What do you mean traditionalist? Like in America, when you say about tradition, you, you think of. Um, so conservative or Tory? Yes, yes, that's it. No. Far from. Uh, Tim, what party? I don't. I don't. I haven't voted for. But, 15, 20 yeah. years. There's no point. And you call yourself a Democrat. I mean, I mean, Republican. No, the the work, the way the, our government work, the way our government works. No matter what who you vote for, they all get in the par. It's so, a par so you exactly. tell me, wait, is there an electoral system in Britain? Or is it yes, no, we have no, first past the post um, in no. Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, because the country is so heavily divided, um, if you said first past the post, you might have. Um, say 50% of you, um, unionists or people wanting to join Northern Ireland, uh, join Ireland or whatever, um, being ruled by a majority party which completely disagrees with them. So you'll have unjust representation or unfair representation, or even just not represented at all. So you have um, SDV in order to make sure everyone is representative somewhat fairly in um, the Parliament, in the Irish Parliament. We do no, not have an opposition in our in our uh, executive. Uh, yeah. There's no opposition. Everybody is in charge. Well, I mean, I honestly always like. Um, I always thought the parliamentary system was popular vote. Honestly, it is, but there's no. You have to understand this. There is no opposition. Every party gets a position in power, no matter how many votes yeah. they get. Imagine so, there's four or five different people in charge of America. Different parties in charge of America. So is it like? Is it like That's the best comparison. So is it like communism? No, it's not like communism. No, 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 no. You no, didn't, you didn't let me off. finish. You, no, no, no. You didn't let me finish. It's it's a, is it like communist China, where one political party pretty much runs parliament? No, no it's like five, five or six political parties run parliament. Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, communism times six. No, the, the party, the, hell. No. the <laughs> party that gets the most votes gets. Communism the most says one party anyway. In charge, so that, so. Uh, there are two people from the top party. They have two ministerial posts. The next party, who's about the same size but slightly smaller, have two ministerial posts. The next party down has one. The next party down has one. The party after them has one. Everybody else is too small to consider. So all of the ministerial posts are sort of covered by four parties. So is that so, why? Is that why um, you have like smaller parties grouping with the bigger parties, or no? No, all of the parties are in charge. They all work together. It's there basically, are, there's no opposition. Okay, basically, imagine five people with completely different views all sitting around a table trying to work out how to rule a country. That is the politics in Ireland. That's the simplest got, explanation. I've, I've got, it's crude and slightly wrong, but it's accurate enough. I've got a much more fundamental sort of like question to ask, if I may. Yeah. Um, why is it that um, people in Northern Ireland have this ability to put in an extra vowel uh, in a simple word, word such <laughs> as N-O-W, which I would pronounce now, and you what? pronounce as nay. Well, it's like five, five extra vowels. Extra. Uh, well, we say lots of words like we say arse instead of ass. I don't know. Well, we say ass. No, but when you say it, it sounds like A-S-S. When I say it, it sounds like A-R-S-E. Well, say say N-O-W for me. No. No? <laughs> it's, like, it's, no? Like it's like you're saying nay. Like you're saying like nay and like you're saying Bill Nye, not, not um, what was the word? Now? It's where I was born. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 I can't say, 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 say nigh. It's, it's, 
If you say if you say now, I'll be pissed. It's like if you ask a Bostonian to say, "Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye." Do you mean hear thee, hear thee, hear thee? Yeah, exactly, exactly. They can't okay, say it. we'll try. We'll try another one. D O W N. Down. 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 Are they going to say Dune? <laughs> Dune. <laughs> You're somehow <laughs> slipping an extra vowel somewhere in there. You're gonna say, <laughs> cannot. You're gonna say Dune. I think Dune, so. I, I actually, I actually heard someone say that. No. Instead of them saying down, they say Dune. I'm going Dune. No, that's still people. Deedle D wants you to say iron. Iron. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds like you're saying I I, Aaron. Aaron. The, the name of our local football team is Norn. Aaron. No. <laughs> Norn. No, no. Norn. Sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the, <laughs> Who, right, I know you're, you're, you don't play soccer in the States, but have you, yeah, who we do. is the best football. football team in the world? You mean football? Yes, football team. Who's the best football team in the world? I have no idea. I'm going with the Jets. Right. Wrong. I don't uh, know. I'm talking them? about national team. National teams. Uh, that is a national team. Aston Villa. I've got a question national for you, Tom. Teams. If I may. Yeah, go ahead. What is... 33 minus one third. No, no, it's oh, 34 minus two thirds. Yeah, you got it all the way around. I'm you sorry. Right. Uh, no, 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 you're thinking of this. Uh, my children, cousins, the Mexicans, as we call them, because they're from south of the border, they say 33 and a third. <laughs> we say 33.3. So, um, uh, how do you say aluminum? Aluminium. Aluminium. Yeah, why is that? Properly. Because we understand how the English language works. But isn't isn't aluminum correct too? Right. No, you're wrong. Right. See when you get two bits of uh, electronic equipment and you put them together and then you heat them up and you add like some metal together to join them together. How do you pronounce that? When you do what? Solder. You you get two bits of electrical equipment and you put them together and you add a, you add heat and you add some. You mean uh, solder? Yes, how do you spell it? S O. Ah, uh, fuck, I'm horrible at spelling. Ah! Uh, so. S O D E R? No, S O L D E R. S-O-L-D-E-R. That's slaughter. No, you pronounce it slaughter. Americans pronounce it without the L. Hey, let's see how you Why? Why do you stuff? butcher the English language? Because uh, I'm American, and deal with it. <laughs> I think we should generally. We should do what John Cleese says. Just re re conquer and, America and re educate how the English language works. What about um? What about how do you say um? Um, what's another British word? Not British word. What's another word that Brits say differently? Uh. No. What, what the Northern people say differently a lot. My, my daughter teaches English in Japan, and uh, she we call things that are small. We. W E E, uh, and it really, really freaks people out. It really does. I don't know whether they use that in, in the UK mainland so often. Nah, nah. It's not really done. I'm, I'm done south. I have literally the most <laughs> southern farmer rural education to the English language. I still use the word "made" on occasion and by accident. It's really not useful when you're trying to have an intelligent conversation you with a woman, and you just say, "All right, mate, how are you?" It just does not work. It defeats. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. In, we use "made" to refer to women <laughs> a lot. What? That's it's like that's, that's like using the word offensive. "hot." That's like using the word "hot" or "chick." You know, at the not like you know a chick. You call a woman. Yeah, well, a if chick. you're having an intelligent debate and you say, "How are you, chick?" You're not going to be seen as... No, nah, you're not going you know, to prove go down well. Yeah. No. Why did you just use made casually in a conversation does that, mean, does, that mean, does that mean a woman will say to a man, Hey, rooster? <laughs> Sorry, what's the opposite of a maid a rooster? I, I thought chick, the opposite of a chick is a rooster. Yes, but we don't say chick, we say maid. What's the opposite of maid? I guess Sir? butler. No, surely the opposite of sir is ma'am. No, the opposite, opposite of maid would be is... sir. Yeah, sir. This has got so confusing. I just don't understand my language anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you learned is a lie, I'm sorry. Yeah. There was one word which in American has annoyed me. What is it? Fag. 
You mean you I'm mean... going out to have a fag is a perfectly legitimate sentence. But if you go to America and you say I'm just going to have a fag outside, it that does sounds not. Like, that sounds like you're going to get a um, a BJ. Do you want corner. a fag? What? Does not. Yeah, and a, <sighs> a, fag, a faggot is a bit of pork, but yay big. Oh, a fag and chips. Yeah. Fag and chips. Fag and chips is so nice. A faggot, F A G G O T. Faggot. It's not. It's not a, what it means in America. It's. Yeah. It's a it's a meatball with gravy. I love a fucking chips. <laughs> fucking chips is just so nice. What's wrong with fa what's wrong with a good piece of faggot? <laughs> oh dear. I mean, DPR. What what ticks you off about Americans? Since this is a European audience, what what do you think? Okay, let's let's all. I love licking those faggots in my mouth. All right, I'm just just lowering the tone as far as possible. Yeah, I know. I'm um, DPR. Are you there? Yeah. What would you, well, what you say? What, what irritates you the most about Americans? Um, they don't really. Uh, I love them. Um, okay, okay, American I, I creationists. I've kind of worms here. I, I'll tell you what I hate, I hate about America. Oh, okay. Uh, not individual. America is it's arrogant. Um, and the fact that it doesn't really see the world in the way that other people see America. It, it doesn't have this intro um, inspection that it ought to have. It doesn't understand why um, the world hates America. Yeah. I mean, Steve, uh, can I ask you The sort of insular yeah. arrogance that it has. And, just... and, and, and there is a serious point behind this. Unfortunately, uh, I do think that this link of view, which uh, <coughs> say Obama has done the best get over, um, but this blinkered view that, you know, America is the greatest country in the world and outside America doesn't, who cares, the here be dragons or whatever. Um, Can I just ask you a question, Strife? Go ahead. It's a serious point because it does affect uh, international relationships in a way that um, most Americans do not understand. Go ahead. How, how many times have you gone out of America or your country? Uh, once. Once. Um, where to? I think it was somewhere in the Caribbean. Caribbean. That's... I'm not even sure how that's barely anything, is it? I mean, this is the thing. 30% of Americans... And that was when I was passports. a baby. I don't remember shit. 30% of Americans don't even have passports. I mean, half of them... Yeah, I don't have passports. Half of trips outside of America, from America to somewhere else, um, are, to, are basically to Mexico. There's no long-distance travel to how other, country, other countries and how people view America, and as such, people have this, in America, some extreme ultra palingenetic nationalism, some nationalist idea that America is the greatest country on earth, and um, compared to everywhere else, especially Britain and European nations, more, more so. Yeah, I mean, going to Caribbean is like going to the Isle of Man. It's not going, that makes no sense if you're American, but it's like just going about 20 um, miles well, to I, nowhere. I, I was there when I was very young, so I don't remember shit. Really? I really no, this is the point. It's cre it creates some extreme, I mean, I think DPR has pointed this out, it creates some extreme nationalism where you view your country as best and don't s care how, how other countries view you, which, which surprisingly enough is extremely quite negative. Well, would you say it's a patriotism or nationalism? Well, patriotism is a form of nationalism. I don't know. I would say both. I don't think it matters too much what, what label you attach to it. Um, uh, the fact is that um, the majority of the rest of the world despises America because yeah, of I know. its uh, You you do know that. Yes. Why why do you think that that is the case? Um, I would say because America acts like a world police and pretty much it has no reason yeah. to do the shit it does half the time because I, I wouldn't. Yeah. Absolutely. I wouldn't personally. You nailed it. No, stop saying you've nailed it in one. It's a strike. Absolutely nailed it. It it. it has this um, ridiculous idea that they are the police force of the world, and whatever they do is right, and they can do no wrong. So they That's can invade whatever countries they like, they can also completely uh, behave in a way totally contrary to any form of Geneva Convention or international law by uh, having uh, Guantanamo and torturing people. Oh, that's all right for them, but hey, anyone else do it? we're going to stamp on that because we're Americans and we're the police of the world. Uh, that is why people hate America. 
Yeah. 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 Ye
He was in charge of defense and military or war or something. I don't know shit, I was like a young kid then. I can't remember the bloke's name, but he was the only one in the entire cabinet who said we should keep going. Is it called a cabinet in America? I don't know. The only bloke in the... I call it a cabinet anyway. The only bloke in the cabinet... The cabinet is picked by continue. the... The cabinet is picked by the president. Yeah, he was the only... The Secretary of War was the only one who said we should continue, and they continued. That's the problem. The, the, the whole point about Iraq uh, was... The whole, they were happy with Saddam as long as he was towing the line. And they stopped towing the line... Yeah, and that was it. They supported his regime for years and years. They gave him funds. They gave oh, him. Oh, oh! You they, mean the Persian Gulf War, right? No, before that, before that, they were oh. supplying. They were the powers that be were supplying Saddam with his. They knew he had weapons of mass destruction because they supplied him with poison gas, which he used on the Marsh Arabs and he used on the Kurds. Uh, when they pulled out of the first war, they knew. That he, they, he asked them, could they use helicopters when they have no fly zone? Schwarzkopf said yes, the biggest mistake ever. They used the helicopters to, to basically gas the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs with the gas that they got from the West. Yes, I, mean, I, I, think, heard, I, heard I think the of... world would be a lot happier with America, um, even acting as well. They think that wouldn't be brilliant, happier with it, if it at least was more than consistent. I mean, and you have a system which oppresses one group, um, that's immoral, and starts helping out another group. The problem just is, arbitrarily or only because of money involved. Well, the problem, the, problem is, the problem is this, in my opinion, if I could go back in time to change a, a, a point in history that America, you know, to, to pretty much, if I would say fix now, I would say the point would be, um, oh wait, I just forgot. What was I going to say? Um, give me a moment. It would be, oh yeah, the turn of the century, America. The turn of the century. Because right after that, in my opinion, that's when America went to, through a change. Like after the First World War, it went to a change of more imperialistic um, factors. Because, heck, Spanish-American War, America got new territories. You know, everything. Pretty much the turn of the century, America was a, a, a blossoming superpower, but it was not a corrupted superpower, I would say? Yet? What do you think? Yeah, I, th I don't think there's any particular point that you, know, you could sort of... There's no time you could point that. I don't honestly think there I'm is. I'm not saying a time exactly. There, there, ha there always has to be a country that is in charge of the world. It's, al it's always been the way. You know, it was Italy for a long while. Uh, before that, it was Egypt. Greece had its chance. There's always been well, somebody who controls. Eighty years between the fall of Napoleon, um, yeah. there was a quite well, I guess overall, but in Europe at the very least, the balance of powers was very much possible. Yeah, but it's, it, it, in general, there's a, there's always a superpower. There's always a, some sort of dominating factor in the world. It's just na human nature. It is when America loses a script, which it will do soon, it will be one. We're talking about this on a hangout on Thursday night. It'll either be one of three countries. It's going to be either China, India, or. Oh wait, I was Korea. there. I was there for that. Yeah. I, I it's, would it's say gonna, it's, it's going to be one of those three countries that will take over. I'm taking China, I, my money's on China, honestly. Well, the smart no, money. I, would China. China. I wouldn't say it's obvious. That, you know, it, I think corporations are taking over from countries at the moment. Well, yeah, because so of taking, just, taken. Yeah, or taken over. I think because of that fact, I would give India and South Korea a shot. They, so wait, what's could the, possibly... the problem is India is completely rife with corruption, and that's the major limit that, to growth. That is, that is food and drink for co corporations. Corruption is food and drink for corporations. They love and it. also war. War, remember, military industries love war. Yeah, but there's not, many, there's not enough wars about anymore. I mean, I would, well, obviously, no, it's still this. You sure about that? Let me rephrase that. You sure about that? There's not enough war in Second World, so North, Second World North, North Africa? The rebels? Who's supplying the rebels? To a massive, ex to a massive extent, many small industries, but there's no major... Yeah, but still, they're making, their, ma they're making their bread and butter from war. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from. I can't see war as an industry going much up. Because usually the boom comes when there's a major war, and I don't see any 
Well, there's no. There's, I don't think there'll going to be a World War Three, but maybe. Okay, maybe there will be a World War Three, but it won't be with nukes. No one's that stupid. Technology. Oh, you will. say that. It's going to be technology. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe creationists are that stupid. Okay. <laughs> is that is that a good point? Maybe creationists are that stupid. Kim Jong Un's that stupid. He's dead. No, Kim Jong Un. Un. Un, not ill. On. Kim Jong Il is not that stupid. Kim Jong Un is. I genuinely have no. He did the IB. The good thing That's is the if only he tries... fact I know about him. He did the international baccalaureate. The good thing is if he actually tries to nuke America, we'll have time to intercept it. They don't have any nukes. I, I, I don't know very I know. much they have any nukes. They, 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 had, those, have... they had the hovercraft landing on the beach, which proved to be a Photoshop. They had the missiles being launched from the, the, the trucks. And that was proved to be a Photoshop. I think they're just full of bullshit. No, wait, what was that whole thing with, like, a few years ago with a, with a nuke test off this coast of Japan? You mean the one that exploded and didn't work? It exploded. It just fell. It, it well, failed. It lost it the just rocket. didn't work. It went, like, 75 meters up into the air and blew up. Yeah. I mean, that's what I heard. I don't know what... They can't even feed their own people. Seriously. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, hey, no, hey, South Korea, yes. why don't you just go up there and fucking kick their ass and take back your the rest of your country? No offense. Because it won't work. It will work. I mean, do okay. you think? Do no, you think, that's 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 exactly the same attitude that America has in Iraq and Iraq. Wait, wait, but you Iraq actually think you actually think if the North if the South Koreans attack now, do you think they could actually not win? I mean, what what's? I mean, of course, they could win, but uh, the, they would control the nation. I yeah. mean, if they would it's simply be sitting there happened. while people revolt against them because who, they who all Who would revolt against them? Drunken. If you're saying the people yeah. in the north who, are not being fed, who, who would revolt against them? The people who are brainwashed, which is the majority in favour of Kim Jong-un and the Kim party. Let me just give, let me give you an example again. Imagine if um, America suddenly, um, its unemployment rate started skyrocketing to about 20%. And then another country came and invaded and killed uh, half, killed a third of the population and imposed rule. You would be quite pissed off. I'd be quite pissed off that happened in Britain. Wait, wait, what happened? If another country, because you were doing quite badly, invaded, killed a massive amount of the population and imposed its own rule. You know what? You know what? You know what? Year movie? Old legislation, sixty year old, leg sixty year old um, legislation. And then we have a group of teenagers try to fucking um, knock them off the land. That that sounds just like Red Dawn. It seriously does. You know, the whole point is, if you get hundred percent employment in America, you know, by killing a third of the population, would you be happy? The answer is no. Well, yeah, the I, I get the metaphor. The metaphor the box, combine ideological, that's a long phrase, ultra-dogmatic um, nationalism to Kim Jong-un and the Kim family, who I'm pretty sure should include Kim Kardashian at this point, would be absolutely <laughs> impossible to revolt against. Um, it's impossible to control, rather. There would just be endless revolt for years and decades. And there's not that much money in it. South Korea is doing better as an independent, um, very education-oriented nation um, than a military one. What is your What is your thoughts on the whole um, foreign policy? Um, I mean, the fo all foreign events recently, DPR? You lose them? I don't know if he's here. The one thing I would say about North Korea is its relation to the United States. And it's very interesting when you register it. Because whenever the United States starts um, going to the negotiating table with uh, North Korea, North Korea starts lowering its demands. And whenever the United States tries to do a bold move, North Korea starts raising its rhetoric and wanting to build weapons again. And if you notice the news, you see America I can't really start that, I'm pretty sure it was North Korea. But you see, North Korea shouted some rhetoric about being against America, as usual. Then American ambassadors and everyone retracting from the nation. Then North Korea getting even more pissy. And then America started making rhetorical shouts against them. And then North Korea considerably getting more pissy. Pretty much North Korea is a, ta a temper tantrum. Yes, it's a t and how do you deal with it? You either ignore it, which will calm it down. Well, you get the fuck you... over there and you spank the living shit out no, of it. No, no, if a child is misbehaving, you ignore him. I'd yeah. say spanking too. No, you don't, spanking doesn't do any good. You ignore them. You, you let them sulk in the corner and what tell happens, they're ready to talk. What happens when you, what happens when we beating up children every time they misbehave? I'd say beat them up. I said, I said say, or hey. Or slap, smack them. 
we got psychopaths. That was the problem. That's why it's been made illegal to beat children in our country because it's because psychologically it's been shown to be well, is extremely it dangerous. To hit children? No. Yeah, I didn't know that. it's brilliant. It, it's, it's a really. I still go to school, so well, <laughs> university. And if you, <laughs> I'm just, sorry. I just had a thought of just so many things happening. <laughs> no, but <laughs> oh dear. Unless you're a celebrity, and then you can do whatever you want. Well, if you're a celebrity, you can do whatever the fuck you feel like. <laughs> then you get a super injunction out. Yeah. I love the super injunction scam. If you're not, um, if you're not um, British, a super injunctions where um, where celebrities getting out laws saying you could not publish who they were uh, when they committed a scandal, and then everyone on the internet posting it twenty times louder than the news agents could. So it was basically a way to get popular. It was quite is fun. that like is that like the whole um, banning movies shit? Like you know the whole uh, um, uh, the Human Centipede. Yeah, kind of like that. Uh, I mean, we, give yeah. an example. Who was it? Was it Wayne Rooney? Someone, someone, um, someone's girlfriend um, was he cheated on his girlfriend essentially? The granny, no, he 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 done a line with the granny, I think it was, in a brothel. Ah, oh, that was it. Some just a little brothel. But I was super injunction against it. And then everyone on the internet posted about it because he got out the super injunction. And so we had to get rid of a super injunction because so many people knew about it. You literally could Google his name and it was the top of the feed. Yeah. It was fantastic. And that is the brilliance of the internet. It's a yeah. double-edged sword, but it's very good in that respect of just shaming idiots doing stupid things. Well, any, idea, any, uh, any idea? Any idea? Well, Tom, can you tell us about your YouTube channel? Oh, yeah, sure, certainly. It's the Tom Tom Paper, the the, the evil-looking Santa guy. <laughs> the, the eyes. The great red bring it. Yeah, it's, it's there's a reason behind it. I explained it the other night, but I think it was an escape call. It was private. Um, basically, you've, have you ever seen uh, Santa and the devil in the same room? The same person. Exactly. <laughs> this They're not. Santa's not on the ground with Satan. You never. You never see him without his hat or his boots on. There's a reason for that. Uh, he can come down a chimney with a fire lit, and it, he, he isn't affected by the heat. It all adds up. Yeah. <laughs> Santa Claus is Satan. Yeah. So he, deep. He, awesome. So deep. He, are you there still, or you're gone? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we were talking about North Korea before um, we talked about Tom's channel. Um, you have anything to say about North Korea? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good response. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, what can you say? Uh, it's a joke. Would you say he was like Saddam Hussein and shit? No. Of course. I feel really I, sorry. I, 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 don't, I don't fully understand the motives of um, uh, Kim Jong Un. Um, but um, he's crying for attention. Um, yeah, he's a temper tantrum. Well, recently he, he's not been getting it, but um, it was a desperate cry for attention. Um, and uh, it seems as if the motive's probably because he wants to have sanctions lifted, and he thinks the best way of doing this is to um, threaten uh, like a petulant child. Um, but what I thought was absolutely hilarious was um, a part of uh, his um, propaganda was to show <coughs> clips of his forces uh, sort of like invading uh, a beach and there were certain photographs that were um, sent off from North Korea um, showing all his hovercrafts invading a beach and analysis showed that um, of the, I don't know, a uh, couple of dozen um, hovercraft. They were photoshopped. Uh, he'd actually had to photoshop these things. To All I can imagine is he had greater forces than he really had. So it was All I can like imagine he, is him just going on his computer, bringing up Microsoft Paint, and just drawing in each one. No way! Wait, you guys ever really seen? You, you guys ever seen the comedy uh, Meet the Spartans? No. Yeah. You seen it? Unfortunately. Yeah, you know, like the part when, like, you know, um, I recommend it. You know, like where they had the um, the uh, the funny uh, the the funny um, what is it, the whiteboard or the board where you put a projection on of his forces? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, that's kind of like what King Jong Un did. He's like, he's like, hey, I got more than you say because 
Yeah. Yeah. I did love the um uh I did love how he how as a great display of military strength he organizes his troops to make a picture of the North Korean flag. Because that's fucking the, scary. The problem with North Korea is that Kim Jong Un and his father before him control all of the media. They control the telephone network. They control the television. They control the internet. Uh, They've what? repackaged Ubuntu. Uh, they put their own software on top of it, and that's the only thing that people are allowed on their computers. So they <laughs> control their computers. It's a it's a locked down society. There's no way those people. In that country, you know what's going on in the wider world, except for what he tells them. And it's one of the interesting things is that South Korean, um, what do you call them, telephone lines, or the telephone signals, they're actually so strong now you can get them a few miles into North Korea. What do you mean? So you, you, can, can, you can actually call someone in North Korea? No, but if you get to the border, but if you get to the border, and you have um, a phone, you can essentially tap into the South Korean in, um, internet. Basically, it's really quite strange. I mean, I mean, would you say? Um, uh, I mean, um, John Sweeney, who came down to do a talk with us in our humanist meeting a while ago. Well, a couple few days ago, um, he went. He went on off. He went to the North Korea, um, and he went around with the LSE students. And the one thing you, he says is the most obvious, prominent thing is everywhere you go you will see a picture of Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un or someone of the Kim family because they are literally everywhere. It's like, it's like, it's like Big Brother's watching. Yeah. But I mean, but the thing is that I'm curious about is like, like you guys remember that Kim Jong-un, uh, wait, which is the father? Kim, I guess. El, Kim Jong-il. Kim, Kim, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like he, um, if he had a, get a new name. What? If you may get a new name, it's going to get really Well, confusing. at least it's not like Kim. It's not like everyone in South Korea is called Kim or Lee. You know, it's, it's original. It's original. So, um, but you know, like how he had a thing with basketball. I think it was he had like a fan of basketball. Yeah. Like, isn't that kind of strange that he was a fan of American basketball, even though he was, you know, supposed to think, "Hey, you guys are pieces of shit. We're gonna kick your ass. We're gonna nuke you," kind of stuff every t every fucking moment. What? Well also, the father, Kim Jong-il, played golf, and the first time he played, he got, uh, I think it was six or seven holes in one. Yeah. Did you know at the age of three, Kim Jong-un learned to drive, and at the age of eight, he beat up a bear with his bare hands? I, I, I don't think that's true. I honestly don't think It's all is. true. It's all come out of North Korea. North Korea never lies. You know North Korea's propaganda expert? He uses, this is the best source of propaganda, he says, he uses the Bible. <laughs> some rich no, 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 no! He uses only the good parts. That's what. That's what he uses. I'm gonna find all. I can find the references. North Korea Bible. It's just brilliant. I love that fact. I mean, it sounds like. What, some... It honestly sounds like what America would be like if Christian fundamentalists took over. It, it honestly does. Yeah. Like every place yeah. you go, every yeah. place you go, you would see Jesus saying, "I'm watching you." Like pretty much, it would be creepy seeing a cross in every room. You know, kind of like the Catholics have. Is that Catholics? Uh, probably. Uh, I I probably live in the only part of the UK that is actually run by Christian fundamentalists, and it is very sad. What do you mean? What part? What do you mean? What part? Northern Ireland is run by Christian fundamentalists. I pity you. Well, I pity myself too. I'd rather move to Britain. The rest of the UK is fine. Just just here. You sure about that? Yeah, yeah. What about that? Off, what about yeah. that whole uh, what's it called? Uh, who's the guy that debated Hitchens? Blair. H Hitchens. Yeah, Blair. Blair. Yeah, yeah, Blair. Blair was poor. Yeah. I mean, Hitchens should have won anyway, but Blair, Blair was just quite poor. What do you mean? I mean, like, isn't he fundamentalist? Tony Blair? Uh, no. Well, no. He was a Catholic. He is a Catholic. Yeah. He specifically, he though, never was Catholic while in office because he realised, because he said specifically religion should have no place in no, public office. No, the reason why he was never Catholic in office because it was against the law for a Catholic to, hold, to be a ah. prime minister. Now, I had a discussion with this uh, with my old politics lecturer. It's only if you're monarchy. It's only if you're in the monarchy. 
because you have this uh, very. I'm like, fairly sure. I'm fairly sure that, that it would it would never be a Catholic elected as prime minister. Oh. It would go relatively badly, but he. I mean, everyone knew he was um, Catholic, and he was going to be be ordained as Catholic when he left. So I don't think there's any real problems with it. Do and you think, hardly. Do you think? Do you would, think in your lifetime, Steve, that you'll see an, an atheist prime minister? Nick Clegg is atheist. Okay, too late. That's a real insult, isn't it? Our best representative, uh, Nick Clegg. I would, I would say, just going from what I've seen, that I would strongly suspect that Barack Obama is an atheist. Nah, I, I don't think so. I, I, just look at what he says. Have you ever seen him talking about? Uh, somebody asked him about the Sermon on the Mount, and um, he was doing one of his discussions or talk, town hall meetings, and he said that uh, the American military wouldn't survive the Sermon on the Mount. Um, <laughs> he wouldn't use that. Um, the whole yeah, but I think thing to make, I think they have to say that they're religious to get elected. I just it doesn't ring true to me. It just doesn't ring. You true. know who I honestly thought was an atheist? Um, one of the presidents in the past. Yeah. I, would, I would think FDR was an atheist. Well, the thing is, a lot of them were not very fundamentalist type of Christians. And very much against that, but still Christian. Yeah. I mean, in the same way that we have, what was it, 60%, 65% British yeah. people are Christian, but only 7% go to church, something like that. Fuck! I, I know, I actually think it's the other way around now. I think the last survey they did, the Christians are in the minority. More. Now, I have my thing over there, give me a second. No, because I've got my old demographic sheet from past meeting. Um, yeah. Come on, where is it? There we go. 59.3% uh, of um, British people are Christian. Um, and one quarter no, no, are no religion. Yeah, but no, I'm not talking about that. Is that the census you're talking about? Yeah. I, I'm not talking about that. There was a, a one of these polls where they actually asked people not not what they perceive themselves as, you know, because a lot of people, when they're asked, will say they're Christian because they were born Christian. Like myself, you know, who, earlier on I said I was born a Protestant, mm. but I'm not a Christian. So, yeah. in in the uh, the census, there there is no thing for saying that you're 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 not type that. Um, you know, not, you know. It's not clear. A lot of people put Christian when they're they don't believe. This well, was an independent yeah. survey. Uh, it was run independently and asked people, did they believe in God? And I think it was like about 60% of people said not really. I honestly would say... I'm going to have to go now anyway. Well, it's going well, to be a bit late over there in Britain. Well, yeah, it's like... Well, you, yeah, so much midnight. Well, my, opinion, <laughs> my opinion is I think the ratio of, um, of, of British, um, British Christians is the same ratio as America. The only difference is America actually has more people. So, you know, that kind of would make the, you know, racial... Your Christians are much more Christian than our Christians are Christian. That makes no sense, <laughs> but it kind of does. How do you, how do you, how do you figure? <laughs> because our Christians don't campaign for combining church and state. Well, to be fair with you, yeah, don't campaign for... Uh, yes, uh, it is. It's, yeah. I, I don't understand this. How come ours... We have combined church and state and you don't, yet we're more secular. Yeah, that's strange. It doesn't... <laughs> We don't have a codified constitution, you do, and yet I still think we have better we have respect for human sitting, rights. We have bishops sitting in the government. Um, that does piss me off a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it's who's more Christian out. than you, hey? <laughs> you are, still. No. I'm sorry, you are. Yeah. I'm I say, sorry, I, I, I actually, your, I actually would say we're more... opposition parties campaigning on the grounds that they are more Christian than their current leader. I actually would on say... On grounds, you well, are more Christian. Well, I actually say we're more Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> We're more Jewish. We, we, at least we had a Jewish prime minister. You did? Yeah, Disraeli. What was the last name? Great. Benjamin Disraeli. Probably greatest conservative politician of all time. British? Wait, his name was Israeli? Benjamin Disraeli. Disraeli. As me, meaning of Israel. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know it was... Meaning. Very on the nose. Yeah. Like, we had, a guy, we had a guy in my community named Steve Israel. And, I mean, I mean I'm guessing he's Jewish. I assume he is. I don't think a Christian would make that name. And Tom, um, you want me to put your channel on the link of the bar? Uh, yeah, please, if you want. Um, well, can you give me a link on the Skype thing? And I'll, yeah, and um, this is the after show, and it's been, it's been how long? It's we've been, we and the show ended at four. 
so we've been going almost on for three hours. That's pretty ama seconds. that's pretty amazing, don't you think? Yeah, two seconds, I'll just get you a link here. Um, so yeah, we're signing off. Um, tune in next tune in next week, I guess for um, uh, I mean not, not next week. Tune in tomorrow if you're from the USA or from Britain and you want to stay up late. Um, Seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time, as shown on the banner. Um, and the topic will be decided by tomorrow, and it will be posted this time. So, um, talk to you tomorrow, and see you later. There you go. Put, put it in the chat there for you.